Preface and Introduction of Clayton's Quaker Cookbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. Clayton's Quaker Cookbook by H. J. Clayton. Being a practical treatise on the culinary art adapted to the tastes and wants of all classes with plain and easily understood directions for the preparation of every variety of food in the most attractive forms comprising the result of a lifelong experience in catering to a host of highly cultivated tastes preface one of the sacred writers of the olden times is reported to have said of the making of many books there is no end this remark will to a great extent apply to the number of works published upon the all-important subject of cookery the oft-repeated saying attributed to old sailors that the lord sends victuals and the opposite party the cooks is familiar to all notwithstanding the greater number and variety of so-called cookbooks extant the author of this treatise on the culinary art thoroughly impressed with the belief that there is ample room for one more of a thoroughly practical and everyday life common-sense character in every way adapted to the wants of the community at large and looking especially to the preparation of healthful palatable appetizing and nourishing food both plain and elaborately compounded and in the preparation of which the very best and at the same time the most economical material is made use of has ventured to present this new candidate for the public approval the preparation of this work embodies the result of more than thirty years personal and practical experience the author taking nothing for granted has thoroughly tested the value and entire correctness of every direction he has given in these pages while carefully catering to the varied tastes of the mass everything of an unhealthful deleterious or even doubtful character has been carefully excluded and all directions are given in the plainest style so as to be readily understood and fully comprehended by all classes of citizens the writer having been born and brought up on a farm and being in his younger days of a delicate constitution instead of joining in the rugged work of the field remained at home to aid and assist his mother in the culinary labors of the household it was in this home school in its way one of the best in the world that he has acquired not only a practical knowledge of what he desires to fully impart to others but a taste for the preparation in its most attractive forms of every variety of palatable and health-giving food it was his early training in this homely school that induced him to make this highly important matter an all-absorbing theme and the subject of his entire life study his governing rule in this department has ever been the injunction laid down by the chief of the apostles try all things prove all things and hold fast that which is good introductory a brief history of the culinary art and its principal methods cooking is defined to be the art of dressing compounding and preparing food by the aid of heat ancient writers upon the subject are of opinion that the practice of this art followed immediately after the discovery of fire and that it was at first an imitation of the natural processes of mastication and digestion in proof of the antiquity of this art mention is made of it in many places in sacred writ among these is notably the memoirs of the children of israel while journeying in the wilderness and their hankering after the flesh pots of egypt among the most enlightened people of ancient times cooking if not regarded as one of the fine arts certainly stood in the foremost rank among the useful it was a highly honored vocation and many of the most eminent and illustrious characters of greece and rome did not disdain to practice it among the distinguished amateurs of the art in these modern times may be mentioned alexander dumas who plumed himself more upon his ability to cook famous dishes than upon his world-wide celebrity as the author of the most popular novels of his day in the state in which man finds most of the substances used for food they are difficult of digestion by the application of heat some of these are rendered more palatable and more easily digested and consequently that assimilation so necessary to the sustenance of life and the repair of the constant waste attendant upon the economy of the human system the application of heat to animal and vegetable substances for the attainment of this end 
constitutes the basis of the science of cookery broiling which was most probably the mode first resorted to in the early practice of this art being one of the most common of its various operations is quite simple and efficacious it is especially adapted to the wants of invalids and persons of delicate appetites its effect is to coagulate in the quickest manner upon the surface of the albumen of the meat effectually sealing up its pores and thus retaining the rich juices and delicate flavor that would otherwise escape and be lost roasting comes next in order and for this two conditions are essentially requisite a good brisk fire and constant basting as in the case of broiling care should be taken at the commencement to coagulate the albumen on the surface as speedily as possible next to broiling and stewing this is the most economical mode of cooking meats of all kinds baking meat is in very many respects objectionable and should never be resorted to when other modes of cooking are available as it reverses the order of good wholesome cookery in the beginning with a slow and finishing with a high temperature meats cooked in this manner have never the delicate flavor of the roast nor are they so easily digested boiling is one of the easiest and simplest methods of cooking but in its practice certain conditions must be carefully observed the fire must be attended to so as to properly regulate the heat the utensils used for this purpose which should be large enough to contain sufficient water to completely cover the meat should be scrupulously clean and provided with a close-fitting cover all scum should be removed as fast as it rises which will be facilitated by frequent additions of small quantities of cold water difference of opinion exists among cooks as to the propriety of putting meats in cold water and gradually raising to the boiling point or plunging into water already boiling my own experience unless in the preparation of soups is decidedly in favor of the latter beer and Leibig, the highest authority on such matters decidedly favors this process as in the case of roasting the application of boiling water coagulates the albumen thus retaining the juices of the meat that would be dissolved in the liquid stewing is generally resorted to in the preparation of made dishes and almost every variety of meats are adapted to this method the better the quality of the meats as a matter of course the better the dish prepared in this way but by careful stewing the coarser and rougher quality of meats can be rendered soft tender and digestible a desirable object not generally attained in other modes and pieces of meat trimmings scraps and bones the latter containing a large amount of palatable and nourishing gelatine may be thus utilized in the preparation of wholesome and appetizing dishes at a comparatively trifling cost an explanatory word in conclusion as a matter of strict justice to all parties concerned the author of this work deems it proper to explain his reason for mentioning in the body of some of the recipes given in this book the places at which the purest and best articles used are to be purchased this recommendation is in every instance based upon a thorough and complete personal test of every article commended in these degenerate days of wholesale adulteration of almost every article of food and drink it is eminently just and proper that the public should be advised where the genuine is to be procured without desiring to convert his book into a mere advertising medium the author deems it not out of place to give the names of those dealers in this city of whom such articles as are essential in the preparation of many of the recipes given in these pages may be procured of the most reliable quality and at reasonable rates end of preface and introduction section two of clayton's quaker cookbook this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org clayton's quaker cookbook by h j clayton soups stock the foundation so to speak and first grade essential in compounding every variety of appetizing and at the same time wholesome and nourishing soups is the stock in this department as in some others the french cooks have ever been pre-eminent it was said of this class in the olden time that so constantly was the stock as this foundation has always been termed replenished by these cooks 
that their rule was never to see the bottom of the soup kettle. It has long been a fixed fact that in order to have good soup, you must first have good stock to begin with. To make this stock, take the liquor left after boiling fresh meat, bones, large or small, cracking the larger ones in order to extract the marrow. Bones and meat left over from a roast or broil, and put either or all of these in a large pot or soup kettle with water enough to cover. Let these simmer slowly, never allowing the water to boil, taking care, however, to keep the vessel covered stirring frequently and pouring in occasionally a cup of cold water and skimming off the scum. It is only where fresh meat is used that cold water is applied at the commencement. For cooked meat, use warm. The bones dissolved in the slow simmering furnish the gelatin so essential to good stock. One quart of water to a pound of meat is the average wool. Six to eight hours renders it fit for use. Let's stand overnight, skim off the fat, put in an earthen jar, and it is ready for use. Every family should keep a jar of the stock constantly on hand, as by doing so any kind of soup may be made from it in from 10 to 30 minutes. General Directions for Making Soup Having prepared your stock according to the foregoing directions, take a sufficient quantity when soup is required and season as taste may dictate, with sweet and savory herbs. Salpicant, celery salt, or any other favorite seasoning, adding vegetables cut fine, and let the same boil slowly in a covered vessel until thoroughly cooked. If preferred after seasoning the stock, it may be thickened with either barley, rice, tapioca, sago, vermicelli, macaroni, farina, or rice flour. A roast onion is sometimes added to give richness and flavor. It is a well-known fact that soups properly prepared improve in flavor and are really better on the day after than when first made. By substituting different materials, garnitures, flavorings, and condiments, of which an endless variety is available, the intelligent housewife may be able to furnish a different soup for every day of the year. In following these, as in all other directions for every department of cookery, experience will, after all, be found the great teacher and most valuable aid and adjunct to the learner of the art. Calf's Head Soup Take a calf's head of medium size, wash clean, and soak it an hour or more in salted water. Then soak a little while in fresh and put the boil in cold water, Add a little salt and a medium-sized onion. Take off the scum as it rises, and as the water boils away, add a little soup stock. When quite tender, take the meat from the bone, keeping the brain by itself. Strain the soup, and if you think there is too much meat, use a portion as a side dish dressed with brain sauce. Do not cut the meat too fine, and season the soup with allspice, cloves, and mace, adding pepper and salt to taste. Put back the meat and taking one half of the brain, a lump of butter, and a spoonful of flour, work to a thin batter, stirring in claret and sherry wines to taste, and last of all add a little extract of lemon and one hard-boiled egg, chopped not too fine. If desirable, add a few small forced meatballs. Turtle soup may be made in the same manner. Oxtail Soup Take one ox tail and divide into pieces an inch long, two pounds of lean beef cut in small pieces, four carrots, three onions sliced fine, a little thyme with pepper and salt to taste, and four quarts cold water. Boil four hours or more according to the size of the ox tail, and when done add a little allspice or cloves. Okra soup. One large slice of ham, one pound of beef, veal or chicken, and one onion, all cut in small pieces and fried in butter together until brown, adding black or red pepper for seasoning, along with a little salt, adding in the meantime delicately sliced, thin, sufficient okra, and put all in a porcelain kettle. For a family of four, use 30 pods of okra with two quarts water over a steady but not too hot fire, Boil slowly for three or four hours. When half done, add two or three peeled tomatoes. Chicken Gumbo 
Mrs. E. A. Wilburn's recipe. For the stock, take two chickens and boil in a gallon of water until thoroughly done and the liquid reduced to half a gallon. Wipe off one and one half pounds of green okra, or if the dry is used, one half pound is sufficient, which cut up fine and add to this stock while boiling. Next, add one and one half pounds of ripe tomatoes, peeled and chopped fine, adding also one half coffee cupful of rice. Let these boil for six hours, adding boiling water when necessary. Then take out the chickens, carve and fry them brown in clear lard. Into the fat, put one large white onion, chopped fine, adding two tablespoonfuls of flour. Just before serving, put the chicken, boned and chopped, with the gravy thus prepared, and add to the soup with salt and pepper to taste. Fresh Oyster Soup Take 25 or 30 small eastern and 50 California oysters, wash clean, and put into a kettle over the fire with a little over a pint of water. As soon as they open, pour into a pan and take the oysters from the shells, pouring the juice into a pitcher to settle. If the oysters are large, cut in two once, return the juice to the fire, and when it boils, put in a piece of butter worked in flour, season with pepper and salt, and let it boil slowly for two minutes. Put in a cupful of rich milk and the oysters, along with a sufficient quantity of chopped crackers, and let the liquid boil up once. Should you need a larger quantity of soup, add a can of good oysters, as they will change the flavor but little. In my opinion, nutmeg improves the flavor of the soup. Fish Chowder Take four pounds of fresh codfish, the upper part of the fish is best, Fry plenty of salt pork cut in small strips, put the fat in the bottom of the kettle, then a layer of the fried pork, next a layer of fish. Follow with a layer of potato sliced, not too thin, and a layer of sliced onions, seasoned with plenty of salt and pepper. Alternate these layers as long as the material holds out, topping off with a layer of hard crackers. Use equal parts of water and milk sufficient to cook which will not require more than three-quarters of an hour over a good fire. Great care should be taken not to scorch in the cooking. Clam chowder may be made according to the foregoing formula, substituting three pints of clams for the fish. Clam soup. Take 50 small round clams, rinse clean, and put in a kettle with a pint of water. Boil for a few minutes or until the shells gape open, Empty into a pan, pick the meat from the shells, and pour the juice into a pitcher to settle. Chop the clams quite small, return the juice to the fire, and as soon as hot, work in a good-sized lump of butter with a little flour and juice of the clams. Stir in a teacup of milk, seasoned with black pepper, and after letting this boil for two minutes, put in the clams, adding at the same time chopped cracker or noodles, and before taking up a little chopped parsley. Clam Chowder 100 small clams chopped fine, one half pound fat salt pork put in pot and fried out brown, two small or one large onion, and one tomato chopped fine. Put all in the pot with the clam juice and boil for two hours, after which add rolled crackers and one pint hot milk, letting it boil up. Season with salt and pepper, adding a little thyme if agreeable to taste. Baked Beans and Bean Soup Take three pints of white peas or army beans, wash very clean, soak eight hours, rinse and put to boil with plenty of water, hot or cold, with one and one half pounds beef soup meat and one half pounds of salt pork, letting these boil slowly and skimming as the scum rises. Stir frequently as the beans are apt to scorch when they begin to soften. When soft enough to be easily crushed with the thumb and finger, season with plenty of black pepper and salt. After five minutes have elapsed, fill a nice baking pan, such a one as will do to set on the table. Pour in the liquid until it nearly covers the beans. Score the pork and put it halfway down in the beans and bake in a slow fire until nicely browned. When the remaining beans are boiled quite soft, rub them through a colander into the soup, add one pint of milk, and season with ground cloves or mace. Just before taking up, 
cut some toast the size of the end of a finger and add to the soup. Pepper sauce gives a nice flavor. Dry split pea soup. Soak one quart dry or split peas 10 or 12 hours and put on to boil in one gallon of water with one pound soup beef and a small piece of the hock end of ham, nicely skinned and trimmed. But if you do not have this at hand, supply its place with a small piece of salt pork. Season with salt, pepper, and a little ground cloves, adding a little curry or sweet marjoram. Boil slowly until quite tender. Rub the peas to a colander, adding a little rich milk. This soup should be rather thick. Cut bread in pieces the size of a little finger. Fry in butter or lard and put in the tureen when taken up. Tomato soup. To one gallon good beef stock, add one and one half dozen ripe tomatoes or one two pound can, two carrots, two onions, and one turnip cut fine. Boil all together for an hour and a half and run through a fine tin strainer. Take a stew pan large enough to hold the liquid and put it on the fire with one half pound of butter worked in two tablespoonfuls of flour. After mixing well together, add a tablespoonful of white sugar, season with salt and pepper to taste, stirring well until the liquid boils, then skim and serve. The above quantity will provide sufficient for a large family. Celery Soup To make good celery soup, take two or three pounds of juicy beef. The round is best, being free from fat. Cover with cold water and boil slowly for three or four hours. An hour before taking from the fire, take one pound or more of celery, cut four or five inches long, taking also the root cut thin, and salting to taste. Boil until quite tender, then take out the celery, dressing with pepper and salt or drawn butter. If you have some soup stock, put in a little, boil a few minutes and strain. This is a most palatable soup, and the celery, acting as a sedative, is one of the best things that can be used for quieting the nerves. Pepper Pot Take thick, fat, and tender tripe. Wash thoroughly in water in which a little soda has been dissolved. Rinse well and cut in strips half the length of your little finger. After boiling ten minutes, put in a colander and rinse with a little hot water. Then, adding good soup stock, boil until tender, season with cayenne pepper and salt, a little Worcestershire or Schutney sauce, and some small pieces of dough made as for noodles. Should the soup not be thick enough, add a little paste of butter and flour. You may also add curry if you are fond of it. This soup was popular in the Quaker City 50 years ago and has never decreased in favor among the intelligent inhabitants. Egg Balls for Soup Boil three eggs seven minutes and mash the yolks with one raw egg, a tablespoonful of flour, and a little milk. Season with pepper, salt, and parsley or summer savory. Make into balls and boil two or three minutes and put in the soup just before serving. Excellent for both pea and bean soup. Noodles Rich noodles undoubtedly form the best thickening for nice, delicate soups such as chicken, veal, oyster, and clam. Noodles are made with flour, milk, and eggs, and a little salt, mixed to stiff dough, rolled as thin as possible, and cut in fine shreds the length of the little finger. In all soups where noodles are used, a little chopped parsley should be added just before taking up. End of section 2, read by Bryce Cries, Youngstown. Section 3 of Clayton's Quaker Cookbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betty B. Clayton's Quaker Cookbook by H. J. Clayton. Fish. The so termed food fishes are to be found without number in all portions of the world, civilized and savage and a large portion of the inhabitants of the globe are dependent upon this source for their subsistence. Certain learned physiologists have put forth the theory that food fish is brain-producing and adds to the mental vigor of those who subsist upon it. 
while we are not disposed to controvert this consoling idea if the theory be true the south sea savages who live upon this aliment both in the raw and cooked state and the eskimo whose principal summer and winter diet is frozen fish should be the most intelligent people on earth the modes of preparing fish for the table are equally as numerous as the species the direction given by mrs glass in a cookbook of the olden time is at the same time the most original and most sensible this lady commences with first catch your fish boiled fish fresh fish should never lie in water as soon as it is cleaned rinse off wipe dry wrap carefully in a cotton cloth and put into salted boiling water if cooked in this manner the juice and flavor will be fully retained twenty minutes boiling will thoroughly cook a medium-sized fish fried fish in frying large-sized fish cut the slices lengthwise instead of across for if cut against the grain the rich juices will be lost in the cooking rendering the fish hard dry and tasteless for this reason fish are always better cooked whole when this can be done beat up one or two eggs with two tablespoonfuls of milk with salt to season after dipping the fish in this dry in cracker dust never use cornmeal and fry in good lard broiling fish in broiling fish cut large as in frying grease the bars of the gridiron harden both sides slightly and baste with butter seasoning with pepper and salt fried oysters take large oysters drain the juice and dry them with a cloth and run them in eggs well beaten with a little milk season with pepper and a little salt and after drying in cracker dust fry in equal parts best lard and butter until a light brown oysters in batter save all the juice of the oysters beat two eggs with two or three spoonfuls of milk or cream seasoning with pepper put this into the juice with the addition of as much flour as will make a rich batter when the fat is quite hot put into it a spoonful of the batter containing one oyster and turn quickly in order that both sides may be nicely done brown oyster patties roll good puff paste quite thin and cut in round pieces three and one half inches in diameter on which put a rim of dough about one inch or less high which may be stuck on with a little beaten egg next add a top piece or covering fitting loosely and bake in this until a light brown and put away until wanted stew oysters in their own juice adding a little butter and cream fill the patties with this put on the lid and set in the oven for five minutes and send to the table can oysters with a rich gravy make an excellent patty prepared in this way stewed lobsters or crabs take a two pound can of lobster or two large crabs and cut as for making salad and season highly with prepared mustard cayenne pepper curry powder or sauce piquant and salt to taste put in a porcelain stew pan with a little water to prevent scorching and after letting it boil up once add butter the size of an egg and one tablespoonful of vinegar or half a teacupful of white wine and the juice of half a lemon and the moment this boils add half a teacupful of cream or good milk stirring at the same time set the stew aside and heat up shortly before sending to the table putting slices of toast in the bottom of the dish before serving is a decided improvement end of section three section four of clayton's quaker cookbook this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clayton's Quaker Cookbook by H. J. Clayton Roast, boiled, baked, broiled, and fried, retaining the juices and cooking meats. Too little attention is paid to one of the most important features of the culinary art, particularly in roasting, boiling, and broiling, that is the retention of the natural juices of various meats in cooking existing, as these always do, in a liquid form, unless this is carefully guarded against these palatable and health-giving essences of all animal food, both tame and game, 
are apt to be wasted and dissipated in various forms when the exercise of mature judgment and a little care would confine them to these meats in the course of preparation. By way of illustration, let us suppose that a fowl, a leg of mutton, or some of the many kinds of fish frequently served up in this way is to be boiled in water. If put in cold water and the heat gradually raised until it reaches the boiling point, the health-giving albumen with the juices which give each its peculiar and pleasant flavor are extracted from the meat and dissolved and retained in the water, rendering the flesh and fish insipid and in some cases almost tasteless. If, however, these are plunged at once into boiling water, thereby on the instant coagulating the albumen of the surface at least, and thereby closing the pores through which the inside albuminous juices would otherwise exude and be lost. Besides this albumen, there are other juices which are among the most important constituent parts of every variety of animal food, in which are embodied much of its fine flavor and other nutritive qualities, and deprived of which such food becomes unpalatable and tasteless. All meats, then, instead of being put into cold water, should at the start be plunged into boiling hot water, as this prevents the escape of these juices and retaining not only the delicate and fine flavor of the meat, but confining and retaining its nutritive qualities where they naturally and properly belong. Roast Pig Take a suckling pig, one from three to five weeks old is best. When properly dressed, lay in salted water for half an hour. Take out and wipe dry inside and out. Make a stuffing of bread and butter, mixing to a proper consistency with milk and a well-beaten egg. Season with salt, pepper, and sage, with the addition of thyme or summer savory, with an onion chopped fine and stewed in butter with flour. Sew up and roast for a long time in an oven not too hot, first putting a little water with lard or dripping in the pan. Baste frequently until done, taking care to keep the pan a little distance above the bottom of the range. To Roast Turkeys and Chickens Turkeys and chickens for roasting should never be over a year old. After being properly cleaned, cut the wings at the first joint from the breast, pull the skin down the lower end of the neck, and cut off the bone. Cut the necks, wings, and gizzards into small pieces suitable for giblet stew, which should be put on the fire before preparing the fowls for roasting, which should be done by cutting off the legs at the first joint from the feet. Make the stuffing of good bread, rubbed fine with butter, pepper, and salt, and a teaspoonful of baking powder, seasoning with thyme or summer savory, mixing to the consistency of dough, adding eggs well beaten with good milk or cream. Fill the breast and tie over the neck bone with strong twine, rubbing the sides of the fowl with a dry cloth, afterwards filling quite full. Sew up tight, Tie up the legs and encase the body with strong twine, wrapped around to hold the wings to the body. After rubbing well with salt and dredging lightly with flour, put the fowl in a pan, laying on top two or three thin slices of fat pork, salt, or fresh. Put a little water in the pan and baste frequently, but do not roast too rapidly. Raise the pan at least two inches from the bottom of the range. All white meat should invariably be cooked well done, and turkey or chicken, to be eaten cold, should be wrapped while warm in paper or cloth. When prepared in this way, they will always be found soft and tender when cooled. When the giblets are stewed tender, which they must be in order to be good, chop a handful of the green leaves of celery, adding pepper and salt, and put in. Ten minutes before taking from the fire, add a lump of butter worked in with a tablespoonful of flour and the yolk of two boiled eggs, letting simmer two or three minutes. Then put in the whites of the eggs, chopped fine, with the addition of a little good milk or cream. Some of this stew, mixed with the drippings of the fowl, makes the best possible gravy. Roasting Beef Never wash meat. Simply wipe with a damp cloth, rub with salt and dredge with flour, put in the pan with a little of the suet chopped fine and a teacup full of water, set in a hot oven, two inches above the bottom. The oven should be quite hot in order to close the pores of the surface of the meat as quickly as possible. 
As the meat hardens, reduce the heat a little, basting frequently. Turn two or three times during the roasting, taking care not to let the gravy scorch. Meat cooked in this way will be tender and juicy, and when done will be slightly red in the center. Should it prove too rare, carve thin and lay in a hot pan with a little gravy for one minute. Beef will roast in from one and a half to two hours according to size. All meats may be roasted in the same way, taking care in every case that the albuminous juices do not escape. A good way to roast a leg of mutton. Into a kettle with hot water enough to cover, put a leg of mutton. Let it boil half an hour, and the moment it is taken from the water, salt, pepper, and dredge with flour, and put on to roast with one half a teacup of water in the pan. Baste frequently, first adding a tablespoonful of lard. Cooked in this way, the meat has none of that peculiar mutton flavor which is distasteful to many. Clayton's mode of cooking canvas back ducks. That most delicately flavored wild fowl, the canvas back duck, to be properly cooked, should be prepared in the following style. The bird being properly dressed and clean, place in the opening after drawing a tablespoon of salt dissolved in water. Some add a stick of celery or celery salt to flavor, but this is not necessary. Sew up the opening with strong thread. Have your fire in the grate red hot, that is the oven almost red hot. Place your duck therein, letting it remain 19 minutes, which will be amply sufficient time if your oven is at the proper heat. But as tastes differ in this, as in other matters of cookery, some prefer a minute longer and others one less. Serve the duck as hot as possible with an accompanying dish of hominy, boiled of course. The only condiment to be desired is a little cayenne pepper. Some prefer a squeeze of lemon on the duck, others currant jelly. But the simplest and most palatable serving is the directions given. Clayton's mode of cooking California quail or young chickens. Split the birds in the back and wash, but do not let them remain in the water any time. Dry with a cloth, salt and pepper well, and put in a pan with the inside up. Also put in two or three slices of fresh or salt pork and a piece of butter about the size of an egg with three or four tablespoons of water and set the pan on the upper shelf of the range when quite hot and commence basting frequently the moment the birds begin to harden on the top. And when slightly brown, turn and serve the underside the same way until that is also a little brown, taking care not to scorch the gravy. Having prepared a piece of buttered toast for each bird, lay the same in a hot dish, place the birds thereon, and pour the gravy over all. Birds cooked in this manner are always soft and juicy, whereas if broiled, all the juices and gravy would have gone into the fire. And should you attempt cooking it that way, if not thoroughly, constantly basted, they are liable to burn, and if basted with butter, it runs into the fire, smoking and destroying their rich natural flavor. I have been thus particular in the directions detailed in this recipe from the fact that many people have an idea that the quail of California are not equal to that of the Atlantic states when, from my experience with both, which has been considerable, I find no difference in the flavor and juiciness of the birds when cooked in the way I have carefully laid down in the foregoing simple and easily understood directions. To cook bone turkey. For the filling of the turkey, boil, skin, trim, and cut the size of the end of your finger two fresh calves' tongues. At the same time, boil for a half an hour in soup stock or very little water a medium sized but not old chicken. Take all the meat from the bones and cut as a calves' tongues. Take a piece of ham composed of fat and lean and cut small also the livers of the turkey and the chicken chopped fine along with a small piece of veal mostly fat cut as the chicken and half an onion chopped fine put all these into a kettle with water to half cover and stew until tender at the time of putting on the fire season with salt and pepper ground mace salpicant celery salt and a little summer savory just before taking from the fire stir in the yolks of two eggs well beaten with three or four truffles chopped the size of a pea, 
and a teacup full of sherry or white wine. When this mixture is cold, put it in the turkey with the skin side out, draw it carefully around the filling, and sew up with a strong thread. And after wrapping it very tightly with strong twine, encase it in two or three thicknesses of cotton cloth, at the same time twisting the ends slightly. These precautions are necessary to prevent the escape of the fine flavor of this delicious preparation. Boil slowly for four hours or longer in good soup stock, keeping the turkey covered with the liquid and the vessel covered also. When taken up, lay on a level surface with a weight to flatten the two sides a little, but not heavy enough to press out the juice. When quite cold, take off the wrapping and thread and lay on a nice large dish, garnishing with amber jelly cut the size of peas. To bone a turkey. Use a French boning knife, five inches in length and sharp at the point. Commence by cutting off the wings at the first joint from the breast, then the first joint from the drumsticks, and the head well down the neck. Next, place the bird firmly on the table with the breast down, and commence by cutting from the end of the neck down the center of the back through to the bone until you reach the pope's nose. Then skim or peel the flesh as clean as possible from the frame, finishing at the lower end of the breastbone. Chickens may be boned in the same manner. To cook ducks or chicken, Louisiana style. Carve the fowls at the joint, making three or four pieces of the breast. Wash nicely in salted water and put on to boil with water enough to cover, adding a little salt. Boil slowly, carefully skimming off the scum. When the meat begins to get tender and the water well reduced, cook four onions, chopped fine, in a pan with pork fat and butter, dredging in a little flour and seasoning with pepper and salt, adding a little of the juice from the fowls. Next, take up the pieces of the meat and roll in brown flour or cracker dust and fry slightly. If the butter is not scorched, put in a little brown flour, stir in the onion, and put it back in the kettle with the meat of the fowl, simmering until the gravy thickens and the meat is thoroughly tender. Breast of lamb and chicken breaded. Take the breast of lamb and one chicken, a year old is best, and after taking off the thin skin of the lamb, wash it well in cold salted water, then put on to boil with sufficient cold, slightly salted water to cover it and boil until tender. The addition of a medium-sized onion improves the flavor. Then take up and when quite cold, carve in nice pieces and season with black pepper and salt. Next, beat two eggs with two or three spoonfuls of milk or cream and a spoonful of flour. After running the meat through this, roll in cracker dust or brown flour and fry in sweet lard and a little butter until a light brown. Next, make a cream gravy. Take a little of the liquid from the chicken and make a rich, thick, drawn butter and thinning it with cream, pour over the chicken while it is hot. The liquid used in boiling the chicken will make any kind of rich soup for dinner. Scrapple or haggis loaf. Take three or four pounds best fresh pork, mostly lean, with plenty of bones, the latter making a rich liquid. Put these into a kettle and cover with hot or cold water and let the mass boil slowly for two or three hours or until quite tender, carefully removing the scum as it rises, after which take the meat out into a wooden bowl or tray. Pick out the bones carefully and strain the liquid. After letting these stand for a few minutes, if in your opinion there is too much fat, remove a portion and then return the liquid to the kettle, adding pepper and salt, and seasoning highly with summer savory. Next, stir in two parts fine white cornmeal and one part buckwheat flour, Deming and Palmer's, until the whole forms a quite thick mush, after which chopping the meat the size of the end of the finger, stir thoroughly into the mush. Next, put the mixture into baking pans the depth of one one half or two inches and bake in a slow oven for two hours or until the top assumes a light brown, taking care not to bake too hard on the bottom. Put in a cool place and the next morning, when after warming the pan slightly so that the scrapple may be easily taken out, 
cut in slices of half an inch thick, which heat in a pan to prevent sticking, and serve hot. A small hogshead or veal is equally good for the preparation of this dish, which will be found a fine relish. Pig's Feet and Hocks Have the feet nicely cleaned and soaked for five or six hours or overnight in slightly salted water. Boil until tender and the large bones slip out easily, which will take from three to four hours. Take up, pull out the large bones and lay in a stone jar, sprinkling on each layer a little salt and pepper with a few cloves or allspice. After skimming off the fat, take equal parts of the water in which the feet were boiled and good vinegar and cover the meat in the jar. This nice relish was known as sous 50 or 60 years ago and is good both cold or hot or cut in slices and fried in butter for breakfast. To cook a steak California style, 1849 to 50. Cut a good steak an inch and an eighth thick. Heat a griddle quite hot and rub over with a piece of the fat from the steak, after which lay on the steak for two or three minutes, or long enough to harden under the side of the steak. After which turn the other side, treating in the same way, thus preventing all escape of the rich juices of the meat. After this, cut a small portion of the fat into small and thin pieces, to which add sufficient butter to form a rich gravy, seasoning with salt and pepper to taste. A steak cooked in this way fully equals broiling and is at the same time quite as juicy and tender. A good way to cook a ham. Boil a 10 or 12 pound ham slowly for three hours. Strip off the skin. Take a sharp knife and shave off the outer surface very thin and if quite fat, take off a little and spread over the fat part a thin coating of sugar. Next, put the ham in a baking pan with one half pint of white wine and roast half an hour. Baste often, taking care that the wine and juice of the ham do not scorch as these form a nice gravy. Whether eaten hot or cold, the ham should be carved very thin. Beef steak broiled. Place the gridiron over a clear fire Rub the bars with a little of the fat to keep from sticking. The moment it hardens a little, which closes the pores of the meat, turn it over, thus hardening both sides. You may then moisten with butter or a little of the fat of the steak and season with salt and pepper. Lay on a hot dish along with the best butter, which, with the juices of the meat, makes the best of gravy, and cooked in this style you have a most delicious steak. Beef steak with onions. Take five or six onions, cut fine, and put them in a frying pan with a small cup of hot water and two ounces best butter, pepper, and salt. Dredge in a little flour and let it stew until the onions are quite soft. Next, boil the steak carefully. Lay on a hot dish and lay the onions around and not on top of the steak as that will create a steam which will wilt and toughen it to be eaten quite hot. Corned beef and how to cook it. Select a piece of corned beef that is fat. The plate or navel pieces are best and should only have been in salt five days. Put the piece in boiling water in a pot just large enough to hold it along with an onion and a spoonful of cloves or allspice. Let it boil slowly, skimming the first half hour if to be eaten cold. Take it up as soon as tender, and when cool enough, take out the bones and place the meat in a vessel just large enough to hold it, and pour in the fat with sufficient hot water to cover it, letting it remain until quite cold. Beef tongue should be cooked in the same way, after laying in salt or strong pickle from 24 to 36 hours. Spiced veal. Take three pounds lean veal, parboiled and one-fourth pound salt pork, each chopped fine. Six soft crackers pounded, two eggs beaten, two teaspoonfuls of salt, three peppers, one nutmeg, and a little thyme or summer savory. Mold up like bread and place in a pan, leaving a space all around in which place some of the water in which the meat was boiled. Bake until quite brown and slice when cold. Calves liver with bacon. Cut both liver and bacon in thin slices and an inch long. 
taking off the skin. Place alternately on a skewer and broil or roast in a quick oven. Dress with melted butter, pepper, and juice of lemon. Calves or lamb's liver fried. Slice the liver thin and season with salt and pepper. Beat an egg with a spoonful of milk or cream. Coat the slices with this and dry in fine cracker dust. Fry in two parts lard and one of butter until a light brown. If fried too much, the liver will be hard and tasteless. Salt pork fried is very nice with liver and the fat from the pork will be found excellent to fry the liver in. Spiced beef. Take three and one half pounds lean beef chopped small, six soda crackers rolled fine, three eggs well beaten, four tablespoonfuls sweet cream, butter size of an egg, one and one half tablespoons salt, and one of pepper. Mix thoroughly, make into a loaf, and bake two hours, basting as you would roast beef. Fried Oysters Take the largest sized oysters, drain off the juice, and dry in a cloth. Beat two eggs in a spoonful of milk, adding a little salt and pepper. Run the oysters through this and fry in equal parts butter and sweet lard to a light brown. End of section 4, read by Bryce Cries, Youngstown. Section 5 of Clayton's Quaker Cookbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betty B. Clayton's Quaker Cookbook by H. J. Clayton. Stews, Salads, and Salad Dressing. Terrapin Stew. Take six terrapins of uniform size. The females, which are the best, may be distinguished by the lower shell being level or slightly projecting. If the terrapins are large, use one pound of the best butter, if small, less, and a pint of good sherry wine. After washing the terrapins in warm water, put them in the kettle alive and cover with cold water, keeping the vessel covered tight. After letting them boil until the shell cracks and you can crush the claws with the thumb and finger, take them off the fire and when cool enough, Pull off the shell and remove the dark or scarf skin, next pulling the meat from the trail and the liver, being careful not to break the gall, which would render the liver unedible. After breaking the meat in small pieces, lay it in a porcelain kettle with a teacupful of water. Put in the wine and one-half the butter, with two or three blades of mace, two or three teaspoonfuls of extract of lemon, two tablespoonfuls of Worcestershire or challenge sauce. Little salt is required, and if pepper is needed, use cayenne. After stewing for 15 minutes, add the yolks of six hard-boiled eggs, work to a paste in the remainder of the butter, thinning with the juice of the stew, adding at the same time a teacupful of sweet cream, and after simmering for three minutes, chop the whites of the eggs fine and add to the mixture. Then take from the fire and make hot five minutes before serving. If kept in a cool place, this stew will remain perfectly good for three days. Stewed chicken, cottage style, with white gravy. Take two chickens, one or two years old, and cut each in about 14 pieces, dividing each joint and cutting the breast in two pieces. Cut the gizzard quite small and put it and the liver with the chicken. When the chicken is half done, Cover with cold water, adding a good-sized onion, and when it reaches a boil, skim carefully, and when the same is about half cooked, add sufficient salt and pepper, and also a handful of the green leaves of celery chopped fine, which will give it the flavor of oysters. Boil slowly until you can tear the chicken with a fork when turn it out in a dish. Next, take one half pound of good butter, the yolks of three boiled eggs, and two tablespoonfuls of cornstarch or flour, and, after working well together so as to form a thin batter, add the liquor from the chicken, return to the kettle, and, after boiling for five minutes, return the chicken, season with nutmeg or sal piquant, adding at the same time a teacupful of cream or good milk. 
also the whites of the eggs chopped fine keep hot until served stewed tripe cut and prepare the tripe as for pepper pot season highly add a pint of soup stock and four spoonfuls of tomatoes with a little butter and half an onion chopped fine cook until quite tender chicken salad boil a good-sized chicken not less than one year old in as little water as possible if you have two calves feet boil them at the same time salting slightly and leaving them in after the chicken is cooked that they may boil to shreds this liquid forms a jelly which is almost indispensable in making good salad when the chicken becomes cold remove the skin and bones after which chop or cut to the size of a pea cut celery and lettuce equally fine after taking off the outer fiber of the former and mixing add clayton's salad dressing the recipe for which will be found elsewhere also incorporating four eggs which should be boiled eight minutes cutting three as fine as the chicken and celery and leaving the fourth as a garnish on serving cold roast turkey chicken or tender veal make most excellent salad treated in this way clayton's celebrated california salad dressing take a large bowl resembling in size and shape an ordinary wash bowl and a wooden spoon fit it as nearly as possible to fit the curve of the bowl first put in two or three tablespoonfuls of mixed mustard quite stiff pour on this slowly one-fourth of a pint of best olive oil stirring rapidly until thick then break in two or three fresh eggs and after mixing slightly pour in very slowly the remaining three-fourths of the pint of oil stirring rapidly all the while until the mixture forms a thick batter next take a teacupful of the best wine vinegar to which the juice of one lemon has been added along with a small tablespoonful of salt and another of white sugar stirring well until the whole of these ingredients are thoroughly incorporated when bottled and tightly corked this mixture will remain good for months those who are not fond of the oil will find that sweet cream of about sixty or seventy degrees in temperature a good substitute but this mixture does not keep so well salad flavoring it will be found a good thing before ornamenting a salad to take a section of garlic and after cutting off the end steeping it in salt and then rubbing the surface of the bowl putting in at the same time small pieces of the crust of french or other bread similarly treated cover the bowl with a plate and shake well this gives the salad a rich nutty flavor end of section five Section 6 of Clayton's Quaker Cookbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clayton's Quaker Cookbook by H. J. Clayton. Eggs and Omelettes. Boiling Eggs. Unless quite sure the eggs are fresh, never boil them, as the well-known remark that even to suspect an egg cooked in this style is undoubtedly well-founded. Hard-boiled eggs, to be eaten either hot or cold, must never be boiled more than eight minutes, when they will be found tender and of a fine flavor, whereas, if boiled for a longer time, they will invariably prove leathery, tough, and almost tasteless, and dark-colored where the whites and yolk are joined, giving them an unsightly and anything but attractive appearance. For soft-boiled, three, and for medium, four minutes only are necessary. Scrambled Eggs Beat well three eggs with two tablespoons of cream or milk, Add salt and pepper. Put in the pan a lump of fresh butter, and as soon as melted, put in the eggs, stirring rapidly from the time they begin to set, as in order to be tender, they must be cooked quickly. To fry eggs, 
put butter or lard in a hot pan, and then as many small beef muffin rings as eggs required. Drop the eggs in the rings. Cooked in this manner, the eggs are less liable to burn, look far nicer, and preserve their fine flavor. Oyster Omelette Stew a few oysters in a little butter, adding pepper for seasoning, and when the omelette is cooked on the underside, put on the oysters, roll over, and turn carefully. A good omelette may be made of canned oysters treated in this way. Ham omelette. Take a thin slice of the best ham, fat and lean. Fry well done and chop fine. When the omelette is prepared, stir in the ham and cook to a light brown. Cream omelette. Beat three eggs with two tablespoons of cream, adding a little salt and pepper. Put a lump of butter in the pan but do not let it get too hot before putting in the mixture. The pan should be about the temperature for baking batter cakes. Fold and turn over quite soon. The omelet should be a light brown and be sent to the table hot. Should you have sausage for breakfast, the bright gravy from the sausage is preferable to butter in preparing the omelet. Spanish omelet. Make in the same manner as the cream omelet, but before putting in the pan, have ready one half an onion, chopped fine and fried brown with a little pepper and salt. When the omelet is cooked on one side, put the mixture on and turn the sides over until closed tight. Omelet for dessert. Beat eight eggs thoroughly with a teacup of rich milk or cream a tablespoon of fine white sugar, and a very little salt. Stir well and make in two omelets. Lay side by side and sift over a thin coating of fine white sugar. In serving, pour over and around the omelet a wine glass of good California brandy and set on fire. End of section six. Read by Carrie Adams, your book voice, at Mesa, Arizona, on the 22nd of February, 2022. Section 7 of Clayton's Quaker Cookbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Gauntz. Clayton's Quaker Cookbook by H. J. Clayton Vegetables Baked Tomatoes Pick out large, fair tomatoes. Cut a slice from the stem end, and placing them in a pan with the cut side up, put into each one-half teaspoon of melted butter, sprinkle with salt and pepper, and bake until they shrivel slightly. Raw Tomatoes Cut the skin from both ends. Slice moderately thin, and, if you like, add a small piece of onion chopped fine. Season with salt and pepper, and pour over Durkee's or Clayton's salad dressing. Cucumbers Take off a thick rind, as that portion between the seed and outer skin is the unwholesome part. Slice rather thin into cold salt water, and, after half an hour, drain off and dress with salt, pepper, wine vinegar, and a little chili pepper sauce covering slightly with Durkee's or Clayton's salad dressing. Boiled Cabbage Cut large cabbage in four, small in two pieces, and tie up in a bag or cloth. Put in boiling water with some salt and boil briskly for half an hour. A piece of charcoal in the pot will neutralize the odor given out by the cabbage boiled in the ordinary way. Cabbage should never be cooked with corned beef, as the fine flavor of the latter is changed to the strong odor of the cabbage. To cook cauliflower. If the cauliflower is large, divide in three. If small, in two pieces. Tie up in a cloth and put in boiling water with a little salt, and cook not more than twenty minutes. Eat with melted butter, pepper and salt, or nice drawn butter. Asparagus may be cooked in the same way, and eaten with similar dressing. 
both cauliflower and asparagus may be spoiled with too much cooking. Care should be taken to drain the water from both as soon as they are done. To cook young green peas. The best mode of cooking this most delicate and finely flavored vegetable, put the peas in a porcelain-lined kettle with just water sufficient to cover, and let them boil slowly until tender. Add a lump of butter worked in a teaspoonful of flour to the rich liquid, with half a teacupful of rich milk or cream. Season with salt and pepper. A good way to cook beets. Take beets of a uniform size, boil until tender, slip off the skin, and slice into a dish or pan. Season with salt and pepper, adding a little butter made hot and the juice of one lemon. Pour this over the beets, set in a hot oven for a few minutes, and send to the table hot. Mashed Potatoes and Turnips Take equal quantities of boiled potatoes and turnips, mash together, adding butter, salt, and pepper, and mix thoroughly with a little good milk, working all together until quite smooth. Boiled Onions Take small white onions if you have them. If large, cut and boil until tender in salted water. Pour off nearly all the water and add a small lump of butter worked in a little flour and a small cup of milk. Add pepper and simmer for a few minutes. All the foregoing are desirable additions to roast turkey and chicken. Stewed Corn If canned corn is used, put a sufficient quantity in a stew pan with two or three spoonfuls of hot water, and after adding pepper and salt to taste, put in a good-sized lump of butter into which a teaspoonful of flour has been well worked, adding at the same time a cup of good sweet milk or rich cream, and let it cook three minutes. Corn cut fresh from the cob should be boiled at least twenty minutes before adding the milk and butter. Stewed Corn and Tomatoes Take equal quantities of corn and tomatoes and stew together half an hour with butter, pepper, and salt, and when taken up, place slices of buttered toast in the dish in which it is served. Succotash This is the original Native American Indian name for corn and beans. In compounding this most palatable and wholesome dish, take two or three pounds of green climbing or pole beans, the pods of which are large and, at the same time, tender. Break these in pieces of something like half an inch long, and let them lie in cold water about half an hour, at which time drain this off. Put them in a porcelain-lined kettle, covering them with boiling water, into which put a large tablespoonful of salt. When the beans become tender, pour off the greater portion of the water, replacing it with that which is boiling, and when the beans become entirely tender, cut from the cob about half the amount of corn you have of the beans, which boil for twenty minutes. But where canned corn is used, five minutes will suffice. About five minutes before taking from the fire, take a piece of butter about the size of an egg, worked with sufficient flour or cornstarch to form a stiff paste. Season them with plenty of black pepper and salt to taste, adding, at the same time, a teacupful of rich milk or cream. Then, to keep warm, set back from the fire, not allowing to boil, but simmering slowly. This will be equally good the next day if kept in a cool place, with an open cover, which prevents all danger of souring. This is a simple, healthful, and most appetizing dish, inexpensive and at the same time easily prepared. Saratoga Fried Potatoes The mode of preparing the world-renowned Saratoga fried potatoes is no longer a secret. It is as follows. Peel eight good-sized potatoes. Slice very thin. Use slicing machine when available, as this makes the pieces of uniform thickness. Let them remain half an hour in a quart of cold water, in which a tablespoonful of salt has been dissolved, and lay in a sieve to drain, after which mop them over with a dry cloth. Put a pound of lard in a spider or stew pan, and when this is almost but not quite smoking hot, put in the potatoes, stirring constantly to prevent the slices from adhering, and when they become a light brown, dip out with a strainer ladle. If preferred, cut the potatoes in bits an inch in length, and of the same width, treating as above. Salsify, or oyster plant. The best way I have yet found to cook this finely flavored and highly delicious vegetable is, first, wash clean, but do not remove the skin. Put the roots in more than enough boiling water to cover them, boil until quite soft, 
Remove the skin, mash, add butter, and season with pepper and salt. Make into the size of oysters, and dip in thin egg batter. Fry a light brown. If the plant is first put into cold water to boil and the skin scraped or removed, the delicate flavor of the oyster, which constitutes its chief merit, will be entirely dissipated and lost. Eggplant There is no more delicate and finely flavored esculent to be found in our markets than the eggplant, when cooked in the right manner. Properly prepared, it is a most toothsome dish. If badly cooked, it is anything but attractive. Of all the varieties, the long purple is decidedly the best. Cut in slices less than one-fourth an inch in thickness. Sprinkle with salt and let the slices lie in a colander half an hour or longer to drain. Next, parboil for a few minutes and drain off the water. Season with salt and pepper and dip in egg batter or beaten egg and fry in sweet lard mixed with a little butter until the slices are a light brown. Serve hot. To boil green corn. Green corn should be put in hot water with a handful of salt and boiled slowly for half an hour or five minutes longer. The minute the corn is done, pour off the water and let it remain hot. All vegetables are injured by allowing them to remain in the water after they are cooked. Boiled rice. American rice, for all its preparations, is decidedly preferable, the grain being much the largest and most nutritious. In boiling, use two measures of water to one of rice, and let them boil until the water is entirely evaporated. Cover tightly, set aside, and let steam until every grain is separated. When ready to serve, use a fork in removing the rice from the cooking utensil. The foregoing recipe was given me by a lady of South Carolina, of great experience in the preparation of this staple cereal product of the southern Atlantic seaboard. Stewed Okra Cut into pieces one quart of okra, and put to boil in one cup of water. Add a little onion and some tomatoes, salt and pepper to taste, and when all is boiled tender, add a good lump of butter, worked in with a spoonful of flour, and let stew five minutes, stirring frequently. End of section 7《Section 8 of Clayton's Quaker Cookbook》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betty B. Clayton's Quaker Cookbook by H. J. Clayton. Bread, Cakes, Pies, Puddings, and Pastry. Solid and Liquid Sauces. Quick Bread. Mix two teaspoonfuls baking powder with quart of flour, adding one teaspoonful salt and sufficient milk or water to make a soft dough, and bake at once in a hot oven. If eaten hot, break. Use a hot knife in cutting. Quick Muffins. Take two eggs, two tablespoonfuls best lard or butter, one teaspoonful salt, two teaspoonfuls baking powder, one tablespoonful sugar, one quart good milk, and flour to make a moderately stiff batter and bake at once in muffin rings. Brown bread. Three cups of yellow cornmeal, one cup flour, two sweet, and one half cup sour milk, with one half cup syrup, one teaspoonful soda, and a little salt. Bake four hours. Graham rolls. Two cups graham and one of white flour, one half cup of yeast, or one third cake compressed yeast. 2 teaspoonfuls sugar, mix with warm milk or water, and let stand upon range until light. Mississippi River Cornbread 1 pint best yellow cornmeal, 1 pint of buttermilk, 2 tablespoonfuls melted butter, 2 eggs and teaspoonful of salt, 1 teaspoonful saleratus, mix well and bake at a brisk fire. Nice Light Biscuit Before sifting, 1 quart of flour, Put in two or three teaspoonfuls of best baking powder, adding a little salt after sifting. Follow this with three tablespoonfuls of best lard and with good milk. Mix into soft dough, working as little as possible. Roll full half an inch thick, cut and bake in a hot oven until slightly browned on top and bottom. Clayton's Cornbread Take three cups of good cornmeal, either yellow or white, and one cup of flour. Add a teaspoonful of baking powder, stirring well together. Next, put into a vessel 
two eggs well beaten one tablespoonful of sugar a little salt a large tablespoonful of sweet lard or butter and milk enough to make a thick batter let these come to a boiling heat stirring well at the same time then pour in the meal and beat to a stiff consistence turn into a baking pan and bake until thoroughly done brown on top and bottom use hot milk in mixing as in my opinion it takes the raw taste from the cornmeal johnny cake two spoonfuls of melted butter one egg well beaten two teaspoonfuls baking powder two cups milk one half cup sugar or syrup two cups each cornmeal and flour bake in a moderate oven until brown sweet potato pone one large sweet potato grated one cup yellow indian meal two eggs one tablespoonful butter one half cup molasses one half cup sugar salt and spice to taste add sufficient milk to make the usual thickness of cake gingerbread one pint molasses one half pint sour milk two teaspoonfuls ginger one teacup butter one teaspoonful soda two eggs salt molasses gingerbread one cup syrup one half cup sugar one half cup sweet milk two tablespoonfuls vinegar one half cup shortening flour to make moderately thick and large teaspoonful baking powder quaker cake one cup butter three teaspoonfuls ginger five flour one half cup cider or any spirits four eggs and a teaspoonful of saleratus dissolved in a teacup of sweet milk pound cake one cup sugar one half cup best butter one half cup of rich milk or cream three eggs well beaten one and one half cups flour one large teaspoonful baking powder and a teaspoonful ground nutmeg and beat the whole thoroughly before baking chocolate cake jelly cake two cups sugar one cup butter the yolks of five eggs and whites of two one cup pure milk three and one half cups flour one teaspoonful cream of tartar one half teaspoonful bicarbonate soda and stir thoroughly before baking the following is the mixture for filling whites of three eggs one and one half cup sugar three tablespoonfuls of grated chocolate and one teaspoonful extract vanilla beat well together and spread between each layer and on top the cake jelly cake may be made the same way using jelly instead of chocolate currant cake three eggs two cups sugar one butter one milk one half teaspoonful soda one cup currants and a little citron cut in thin slices with flour to make a stiff batter pour into pans and bake medium quick cream cupcake four cups of flour two of sugar three of sweet cream four eggs mix and bake in square tins when cold cut in squares about two inches wide jumbles rub to a cream a pound of butter and a pound of sugar mix with a pound and a half of flour four eggs and a little brandy roll the cakes in powdered sugar lay in flat buttered tins and bake in quick oven sweet cake one cup of sugar one cup sour cream one cup butter one egg one half teaspoonful soda one half nutmeg grated fine flour enough to make a stiff batter bake in a slow oven sponge cake five eggs two cups sugar two cups flour one half teacup cold water mix well and bake quickly ginger snaps into one pint of molasses put one cup lard one tablespoonful of ginger one teaspoonful of soda and a little salt boil for a few minutes and when quite cool add sufficient flour to make a stiff dough roll very thin and bake a nice cake one quart flour four eggs one half cup butter one half cup sweet lard two teaspoonfuls of baking powder and one of salt beat the whites and yolks of the eggs separately until light sift the baking powder into the flour melt the shortening in a cup of milk with the yolks of the eggs putting the whites in last work into a thick batter and bake steadily for three quarters of an hour to be eaten hot icing for cake there are a number of formulas for the preparation of icings for cake but the following will invariably be found the simplest easiest prepared and the best take the whites of four eggs and one pound of best pulverized white sugar 
and any flavoring extract most agreeable to the taste break the whites of the eggs into a broad cool dish and after throwing a small handful of sugar upon them begin whipping it in with long even strokes of the beater beat until the icing is of a smooth fine and firm texture if not stiff enough put in more sugar using at least a quarter of a pound to each egg pour the icing by the spoonful on top of the cake and near the center of the surface to be covered if the loaf is so shaped that the liquid will naturally settle to its place it is best left to do so to spread it use a broad bladed knife dipped in cold water if as thick with sugar as should be one coat will be amply sufficient leave in a moderate oven for three minutes to color icing yellow use the rind of a lemon or orange tied in a thin muslin bag straining a little of the juice through it and squeezing hard into the ice and sugar for red use extract of cochineal chocolate icing quarter of a cake of chocolate grated one half cup of sweet milk one tablespoonful cornstarch flavor with extract of vanilla mix these ingredients with the exception of the vanilla boil two minutes and after it has fairly commenced to boil flavor and then sweeten to taste with powdered sugar taking care to have it sweet enough lemon pie grated rind and juice of two lemons two cups sugar butter the size of an egg two tablespoonfuls cornstarch four eggs rub the butter and sugar smooth in a little cold water have ready two cups boiling water in which stir the cornstarch until it looks clear add to this the butter and sugar and when nearly cold the yolks of four eggs and the white of one well beaten and the rind and the juice of the lemons after lining two deep dishes with a delicate paste and pouring in the mixture beat the remaining whites of the eggs to a stiff froth adding two spoonfuls of powdered sugar spread this over the pies when done returning to the oven to brown english plum pudding three cups flour two eggs one cup milk one half cup brandy one nutmeg a teaspoonful of salt five teaspoonfuls baking powder one half pound currants one half pound raisins stoned and chopped fine one half pound suet chopped fine one cup sugar boil three hours baked apple pudding two cups oatmeal or cracked wheat two eggs one tablespoon butter one pint milk three medium-sized apples a little suet cinnamon to flavor sweeten to taste beat sugar eggs and milk together stir in the meal and then add the other ingredients the apples last after reducing to small pieces bake until well set to be eaten with or without sauce bread pudding one loaf of stale bread soaked in a pint of milk and when soft beat with an egg beater until very fine pour into this the yolks of four eggs well beaten a tablespoonful of butter some flavoring and a little salt beating all well together after baking until well set let it cool and spread a nice jelly over the top and on this put the whites of the eggs beaten to a stiff froth returning to the oven to brown baked cornmeal pudding into a large cup of cornmeal stir one pint scalded milk a small cup suet chopped fine two-thirds of a cup of syrup or molasses salt to taste and when cold add one pint milk and two eggs well beaten one teaspoonful cinnamon and one cup raisins bake three hours cornstarch pudding baked four tablespoons cornstarch one quart of milk two eggs three-quarter coffee cup white sugar adding butter size of an egg with flavoring to taste after dissolving the cornstarch in a little cold water heat the milk to boiling and stir this in and boil three minutes stirring the mixture all the time next stir in the butter and set away until cold beat the eggs until very light when add the sugar and seasoning and then stir into the cornstarch beating thoroughly to a smooth custard pour into a buttered dish and bake not more than half an hour this pudding is best eaten cold with sauce made of cream and sugar flavored with nutmeg or cinnamon or both or plain powdered sugar as tastes may prefer delmonico pudding one quart of milk three tablespoons cornstarch put in hot water until it thickens to the yolks of five eggs 
add three tablespoonfuls white sugar two tablespoonfuls vanilla and a little salt pour on the cornstarch stir thoroughly and bake 15 minutes but not long enough to weigh beat the whites of the eggs to a stiff froth add three tablespoonfuls of sugar one half teaspoonful vanilla put on top and let brown peach ice cream pare and cut in pieces one dozen peaches or more if desired and boil with one half pound loaf sugar when reduced to a marmalade press through a fine sieve and when cool add one pint cream and freeze serve with halves or quarters of fresh peaches half frozen around the cream apple snow reduce half a dozen apples to a pulp press them through a sieve add one half cup powdered sugar and a teaspoonful lemon extract take whites of six eggs and whip several minutes and sprinkle two tablespoonfuls powdered sugar over them beat the apple pulp to a froth and add the beaten eggs whip the mixture well until it breaks like stiff snow then pile it high in rough portions in a glass dish garnish with a spoonful of currant jelly strawberry sauce a delicious sauce for baked pudding beat one half cup butter and one of sugar to a cream add stiff beaten white of one egg and a large cupful of ripe strawberries thoroughly crushed ambrosia have ready a grated coconut and some oranges peeled and sliced put a large layer of oranges in your dish and strew sugar over them then a layer of coconut then orange and sprinkle sugar and so on until the dish is full having coconut for the last layer pineapple may be substituted for the orange farina pudding two tablespoonfuls farina soaked in a little milk for two hours one quart of milk set in a kettle of boiling water when the milk boils add the farina stirring four minutes then stir in the yolks of five eggs well beaten one cup sugar and a little salt after boiling three or four minutes pour into a dish to cool flavor and stir in the whites of the eggs beaten to a foam to be eaten cold baked cornmeal pudding take one large teacupful of cornmeal scald one pint of milk and stir the meal in slowly and thoroughly add a small cup of suet chopped fine two-thirds of a cup of molasses salt to taste and when cool add one pint milk with two eggs well beaten one teaspoonful of cinnamon and one cup of raisins bake three hours snow pudding one box gelatin two cups sugar juice of two lemons whites of three eggs one quart of milk five eggs five tablespoonfuls sugar and one vanilla dissolve the gelatin in one quarter pint of water and let stand for two hours then add one quarter pint of boiling water the lemon juice and sugar strain and set away to cool and thicken and when quite stiff add the whites of the three eggs beaten to a stiff froth stir these into the jelly until it looks like snow mold and set on ice for a similar custard add five eggs well beaten in a dish with five tablespoonfuls white sugar fruit pudding one quart of flour two teaspoonfuls yeast powder a little salt one cup suet chopped fine or a one quarter pound butter or sweet lard mix to soft dough and roll quite thin spreading over any kind of cooked fruit sweetened to taste rolling up nicely this may be boiled but is much better steamed as this makes it much lighter this delicious pudding should be eaten with brandy or wine sauce liquid or solid charlotte a russe take one pint rich milk one half ounce of gelatin dissolved in a little hot milk the whites of two eggs beaten to a froth and one cup sugar flavoring with vanilla mix the milk eggs sugar and flavoring and when the gelatin is cold pour it in stirring thoroughly line the dish or mold with slices of sponge cake fill with this mixture and set on ice to cool solid sauce work well into one half cup of the freshest butter one cup of powdered white sugar adding the white of an egg well beaten and worked in with a large spoonful of california brandy or a couple of spoonfuls of good sherry or california white wine working all of these well together that the ingredients may be thoroughly incorporated and seasoned with nutmeg or cinnamon or both as may be preferred liquid sauce take butter the size of an egg and a sufficient flour or cornstarch 
and after adding boiling water to make thick drawn butter boil two or three minutes add brandy sherry or white wine according to taste with a little vinegar or juice of one lemon make quite sweet and season to taste currant or grape jelly wash the currants or grapes well in a pan of water afterwards mash thoroughly and put in a preserving kettle letting them simmer slowly for fifteen or twenty minutes strain through a thin muslin bag and for every pint of juice add one pound of granulated sugar mix well together and boil five minutes and put into glasses while warm cut paper to fit the top dip in brandy and lay over the jelly and when quite cold tie a paper over the top and put away in a dry dark place calf's foot jelly boil four calf's feet in four or five quarts of water until reduced to shreds strain and let the liquid cool after taking off the fat put the jelly in a kettle with one pint of california sherry or white wine three cups granulated sugar the whites of four eggs well beaten the juice of one lemon with half of the grated peel one teaspoonful of ground cinnamon or nutmeg boil until clear and strain into molds or glasses ice cream there are a thousand and one modes and recipes for making ice cream but after having tested the merits of a large number i have found the following formula used by mr piper the former head cook of the occidental hotel of san francisco in all respects superior to any that i have ever used one quart of jersey or best dairy milk with the addition of a pint of rich cream six eggs and one pound of best granulated white sugar thoroughly beaten and incorporated together place the milk in a can set it in a vessel of boiling water and let it come to a boiling heat stirring well at the same time then take from the fire and add vanilla lemon or such flavoring as you may prefer after which set it in ice water to cool and then freeze break the ice for the freezer of a uniform size mixing coarse salt with the mass stir the cream constantly and scrape thoroughly from the sides the more the cream is stirred the more delicate the mixture will be orange ice the juice of six oranges after adding the grated rind of one mix the juice of two lemons and the grated rind of one after adding one pint of granulated white sugar dissolved in a pint of cold water freeze the mixture the same as ice cream lemon jelly one pound sugar three lemons sliced and put into the sugar one ounce gelatin dissolved in cold water sufficient to cover add a quart of boiling water and strain into molds wine jelly one box cox's gelatin dissolved in a little warm water add a large goblet sherry wine and one and one half pints of boiling water sweeten highly and boil briskly to be eaten with cream peach jelly do not pare but rub your peaches place them in a porcelain lined kettle with just enough water to cover let them cook thoroughly from one to two hours then strain through a jelly bag to every four cups of juice add three cups of sugar and set on to boil again sometimes when the fruit is particularly fine and fresh three quarters of an hour or less boiling is sufficient to make a jelly but sometimes it takes longer to test it drop some in a saucer and set on ice if it does not spread but remain rounded it is done roman punch take the juice of four oranges and of the same number of lemons or limes dissolve one pound of white sugar in a pint of water mix all these together and strain after which add one pint of california champagne and two gills of good california brandy if desired freeze the same as ice cream End of section 8。section 9 of Clayton's Quaker Cookbook。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit LibriVox.org。Clayton's Quaker Cookbook。by H. J. Clayton。miscellaneous part 1 butter in butter making with the exception of bread which has been appropriately termed the staff of life there is perhaps no other article of food more universally used by mankind than butter 
notwithstanding this well-established fact, it is a lamentable reflection that really good butter is one of the rarest and most difficult articles to be procured. Although the adulterations of this staple article of food are numerous, the main cause of the quantities of bad butter with which the community is burdened is ignorance of the true methods and slovenliness in the preparation of this staple article, for which no reasonable excuse can be urged. In the making of good butter, no process is more simple or easily accomplished. The Quakers, living in the vicinity of Philadelphia more than a century ago, so thoroughly understood and practiced the art of making the best butter that the products of their dairy sold readily in that city for from five to eight cents per pound more than that produced by any other class. With these thrifty people, cleanliness was really regarded as akin to godliness, and the principle was thoroughly and practically carried out in all their everyday affairs the most scrupulous attention being paid to the keeping of all the utensils used scrupulously clean, and so thoroughly worked the mass that every particle of milk is expelled. The greatest evil to be guarded against is the too free use of salt, which for this purpose should be of the utmost purity and refined quality. I am satisfied from personal observation that the butter made at the Jersey farm at San Bruno, in the vicinity of San Francisco, in every respect, equals in quality the celebrated Darlington, Philadelphia. For the keeping milk fresh and sweet, and the proper setting of the rich cream, an old-style spring house is essentially requisite. Who that has ever visited one of these clean, cool, and inviting appendages, of a well-conducted farm and well-ordered household at some home farm of the olden time does not recall it in the mind's eye as vividly as did the poet Woodworth when he penned that undying poem of ancient home life, the old oaken bucket that hung in the well. Properly constructed, a spring house should be built of stone, which is regarded as the coolest, brick or concrete, with walls at least 12 inches in thickness. The floor should be of brick and not more than two feet below the surface of the ground. The roof should be of some material best adapted to warding off the heat and keeping the interior perfectly cool, while due attention should be paid to the allowance of a free circulation of air and provision be made for thorough ventilation. Only as much light as is actually necessary should be admitted, and where glass is used for this purpose, it should invariably be shielded from the sun. Wall trenches being constructed for this purpose, a constant stream of cool running water should pass around the pans containing the milk and cream, which, for the making of good butter, should never be permitted to become sour. The shelving and other furniture and all wooden utensils used should be of white ash, maple, or white wood in order to avoid all danger of communicating distasteful or deleterious flavors, as there is no liquid more sensitive to its surroundings or which more readily absorbs the flavor of articles coming in contact with it than pure milk. Everything that has a tendency to produce this deleterious result should be carefully excluded. Neither paints nor varnish should be used about the structure, and the entire concern should be as utterly free from paint as the inside of an old-time Quaker meeting house. In making butter, the cream should be churned at a temperature of about 65 degrees. When the churning is finished, take up the lump and carefully work out every particle of milk. Never wash or put your hands in the mass. To each pound of butter, work in a little less than an ounce of the purest dairy salt. Set the butter away, and at the proper time work the mass over until not a particle of milk remains. A word of advice to hotel and restaurant cooks. 
I wish to say a word to the extensive brotherhood and ancient and honorable guild constituting the grand army of hotel and restaurant cooks distributed throughout our country on the all-important subject of making coffee and heating milk. Some satirical writer has sarcastically said that the way to make good coffee is to ascertain how that beverage is prepared in leading hotels and restaurants and then make your coffee as they don't. There is no good reason why coffee cannot be as well made in hotel and restaurant kitchens as in private families or anywhere else. If the berry is good, well browned, and pains are taken for the proper preparation of this popular beverage. Twenty years ago, the art of making coffee in large quantities and of properly heating milk for the same was an unsolved problem. In fact, if not numbered among the many lost arts, might be classed as among the unknown in the culinary art. Twenty-one years ago, the late Mr. Martin, a well-known citizen of San Francisco and the author of this work, produced, as the result of long practical experience, a form for making a decoction of the ancient Arabian berry, which is now in general use throughout the entire Union. True, attempts have been made to improve upon the mode, which was the crowning triumph of the parties alluded to, but they have invariably proved failures, and today, Marden and Clayton's coffee and milk urns stand preeminent in this important department of cookery. These urns are simply two capacious stoneware jars of equal capacity and made precisely alike, with an orifice one inch from the bottom in which a faucet is firmly cemented. Each jar is suspended in a heavy tin casing, affording an intervening space of two inches, which is to be filled with hot, but not boiling water, as a too high temperature would injure the flavor of the coffee and detract from the aroma of the fragrant berry. Suspend a thin cotton sack in the center and half the height of the jar. After putting in this desired amount of coffee, pour on it sufficient boiling water to make strong coffee. As soon as the water had entirely filtered through, draw off the liquid through the stopcock at the bottom of the jar and return it to the sack, passing it through in the same manner two or three times. After five minutes, raise the sack, pour in a cup of hot water, and let it filter through, getting, in this manner, every particle of the strength. Immediately after this, remove the sack, for if it is left remaining but a short time, the aroma will be changed for the worse. Cover tightly, and keep the jar surrounded with hot, but not boiling water. Next, put into the milk urn, also surrounded with hot water, one half the milk for the amount of coffee, and at the proper time, add the remaining half of the milk, having it, in this manner, fresh and not overcooked. Should the milk become too hot, pour in a cup of cold milk, stirring well at the same time. The first of these urns for making coffee and heating milk were those used for the purpose at the opening of the Occidental Hotel of this city, of which Mr. Piper was at that time, the intelligent and experienced head cook. This mode of making coffee in large quantities is still followed at this hotel, which, from the time of its opening to the present, has maintained the reputation as one of the best of the numerous excellent public houses of this city and the entire Union. Clayton's California Golden Coffee Let the coffee which should be nicely browned but not burned, be ground rather fine, in order that you may extract the strength without boiling, as that dissipates the aroma and destroys the flavor. Put the coffee in a thin muslin sack, reaching less than halfway to the bottom of the vessel. Then place it in the pot and pour over enough boiling water to make strong coffee. Let it stand on the hot range two or three minutes, when lift out the sack, pour the liquid in a vessel, and return it through the sack the second time, after which 
Raising the sack again, pour through a little hot water to extract all the strength from the grounds. Next, pour into the liquid, cold Jersey dairy, or any other pure country milk, until the coffee assumes a rich golden color, and after it reaches a boiling heat once more, set it back. Should the milk be boiled separately, the richness, combined with its albumin, will be confined to the top, whereas, if added cold and boiled with the coffee, it will be thoroughly incorporated with the liquid, adding materially to its rich flavor and delicate aroma. Never substitute a woolen for the muslin strainer, as that fabric, being animal, should never come in contact with heat, while cotton or linen, being a vegetable fiber, is easily washed clean and dried. Neither should tin be used, as that lets the fine coffee through and clouds the liquid, which should be clear. To extract its full strength, coffee should invariably be ground as fine as oatmeal or finely ground hominy, and protracted boiling dissipates the aroma and destroys its fine flavor. The very best way to make chocolate. After grating through a coarse grater, Put the chocolate in a stew pan with a coffee cup or more of hot water. Let it boil up two or three minutes and add plenty of good rich country milk to make it of the right consistency. Too much water tends to make this otherwise delightful beverage insipid. Good cocoa is made in the same manner. Old Virginia Eggnog Two dozen fresh eggs, one gallon rich milk, one and a half pounds powdered sugar, two pints cognac brandy, or Santa Cruz rum, or one half pint cognac and one half pint Jamaica, or Santa Cruz rum. Break the eggs carefully, separating the whites from the yolks. Add the sugar to the latter, and with a strong spoon beat until very light, adding gradually two dessert spoonfuls of powdered mace or nutmeg. Next, add the liquor pouring in slowly, stirring actively at the same time, after which add the milk in like manner. Meanwhile, having whipped the whites of the eggs with an egg beater into a light froth, pour the eggnog into a bowl, add the white froth, and decorate with crimson sugar or nutmeg, and serve. The foregoing proportions will be sufficient to make 14 pints of very superior eggnog. Clayton's Popular Sandwich Paste Take two pounds Whitaker Star Ham in small pieces, two-thirds lean and one-third fat. The hock portion of the ham is best for this purpose. Have ready two fresh calves' tongues, boiled and skinned nicely, and cut like the ham. Put these in a kettle along with two good-sized onions, and cover with cold water, boiling slowly until quite tender. When add one pound of either fresh or canned tomatoes, stirring for half an hour, adding a little hot water, if in danger of burning. Add to the mixture at the same time these spices, plenty of best mustard, and a little ground cloves, along with Worcestershire or challenge sauce, allowing the mixture to simmer five minutes. When cool enough, pour into a wooden bowl, and after chopping fine, pound the mixture well, while it is warm with a potato masher. After the mass is cooled, it will spread like butter. Should additional seasoning be desired, it can be worked in at any desired time. If not rich enough to suit some palates, one-fourth of a pound best butter may be worked in. The bread used for the sandwiches must be quite cold and perfectly fresh cutting carefully in thin slices, using for this purpose a long, thin-bladed, and quite sharp knife. Take a thin shaving from the bottom of the loaf, then from the top, an inch-wide slice, after removing the crust. Care must be taken to cut without either tearing or pressing the bread. Spread on one side of each slice, as if using butter, and after joining the slices, cut the same to suit the taste. As the best bread is the only kind to be used in making sandwiches, without wishing to make invidious distinctions, 
I must say that Engelberg furnishes from his bakery on Kearney Street, the best I have ever used for this purpose, as it cuts without breaking and does not dry so soon as other breads I have made use of. Welsh Rabbit To prepare Welsh Rabbit, or Rarebit, both names being used to designate this popular and appetizing dish, which has ever been a favorite with gourmands and good livers, both ancient and modern. Take one half pound of best cheese, not, however, over nine months old. Davidson's, Gilroy, California, or White's, Herkimer County, New York, and cut in small pieces. Put over a slow fire in a porcelain lime kettle. When it begins to melt, pour in three tablespoon rich milk or cream. Add a little good mustard. Stir from the time the cheese begins to melt to prevent scorching. Have ready a quite hot dish. Cover the bottom with toast, buttered upon both sides, upon which pour the melted cheese, spreading evenly over. If you prefer, you may use as a condiment a little mustard, pepper, or any other favorite sauce. This is a dish that must be eaten as soon as taken from the fire. End of section 9. Section 10 of Clayton's Quaker Cookbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clayton's Quaker Cookbook by H.J. Clayton. Miscellaneous Part 2. Delicate Waffles. Take one half pound butter. One half pound fine sugar, nine eggs, three pints of milk, one and one half ounces of best baking powder, and two and one quarter pounds sifted flour. Beat the butter and sugar to a cream. Add the yolks of the eggs, the milk, and half the flour. Mix well with the whites of the eggs, beaten to a staunch snow, and add the remainder of the flour. Bake in waffle irons, well greased and heated. When baked, the tops may be dusted well with fine sugar or with the mixture of sugar and powdered cinnamon. Force meat balls. Mix with one pound of chopped veal or other meat, one egg, a little butter, one cup or less of bread crumbs, moistening the whole with milk or the juice of the stewed meat. Season with summer savory. Make into small balls and fry brown. Beef tea. Take three pounds of lean beef, chop as fine as coarse harmony, and put in a vessel, covering the meat with cold water. Cover the vessel tightly, and let boil for four hours, carefully keeping the beef just covered with the water. Pass through a colander, pressing out all the juice with a potato masher. Strain through a cotton cloth and add a little salt. A glass of sherry wine decidedly improves beef tea. Crab sandwich. Put one half pound boiled crab meat in a mortar and pound to a smooth paste, adding the juice of a lemon. Season with salt and pepper with a pinch of curry powder and mix the paste well with six ounces best butter. Cut slices of bread rather thin, trim off the crust, and spread. Something about pork, the kind to select and best mode of curing. The best quality of pork, as a matter of course, is that fed and slaughtered in the country. Corn, or any kind of grain-fed, or more especially, milk-fed pork, as everyone knows who is not of the Hebrew faith, which entirely ignores this. When properly prepared, well-flavored, oleaginous production, and is fond of pork, from the succulent sucking pig, the toothsome and fresh spare rib, unrivaled as a broil, to the broiled or boiled ham, and side meat bacon of the full-grown porker, is vastly superior to the meat of the slop and garbage-fed animal raised and slaughtered in the city. 
more especially as the butchering of hogs in San Francisco is, at this time, entirely monopolized by the Chinese population, who seem to have a warm side, in fact, a most devoted affection for the hog, surpassing even that of the bog trotters of the old sod, for the traditional pet pig that ate, drinks, and sleeps with the old man, the old woman, and the childer. Charles Lamb's account of the discovery of the delights of roast pork and invention of that luxury by the Chinaman whose bamboo hut was burned down in raking his pig, semi-cremated from the ashes, burned his fingers, which naturally clapping into his mouth to ease the pain, which was changed to delight, causing John's torture-smitten visage to assume in an instant a broad grin of satisfaction at the discovery is undoubtedly correct, or at least the love for the pork exhibited by the heathen Chinese cannot reasonably be accounted for in any other way. In order, then, to get the best article of pork, wholesome, toothsome, and, what is most important of all, entirely free from any form of disease or taint, great care should be taken to make selections from the small lots fed and slaughtered in the country and brought into the city most generally in the fall season, and which are to be procured at the stall or shop of any reputable and reliable dealer. Select a carcass of one hundred or less pounds, with flesh hard and white and thin skin. For salting, cut in pieces six by eight inches, and, after having rubbed thoroughly in the salt, neither too fine nor too coarse, take a half barrel, Sprinkle the bottom well with salt, and lay the pieces of pork in tightly. Then add salt and follow with another layer of pork, until the whole is packed, with salt sprinkled on top. Set in a cool place, and after three or four days, make a brine of boiling water with salt, which, when cool, should be sufficiently strong to float an egg. Stir in a half pound of brown sugar, Pour over the meat sufficient to cover, and place on top a stone heavy enough to keep the pork weighted down. Homemade Lard Homemade lard is undoubtedly the best as well as cheapest. If leaf is not to be had, take ten pounds of solid white pork, as fat as possible, which is quite as good if not better. Cut in pieces uniformly the size of your finger and put in a vessel with the thick bottom. One of iron is preferable, and adding one pint of water, put on the range. Keep tightly covered until the water has evaporated in steam. When, leave off the cover, letting it cook slowly until the scraps turn a light brown. When take off, and while still warm, strain through a colander pressing the scraps hard with a potato masher. Pour the liquid into cans and set away. The next day it will be found snow white, solid and of a fine and equal consistence, and for cooking purposes, quite as good as fresh churned butter in making biscuits, any kind of pastry, or frying eggs. In frying lard, keep a careful watch and see that it does not scorch. New Jersey Sausage Take the very best pork you can get, one-third fat and two-thirds lean, and chop on a block with a kitchen cleaver. One half chopped, season with black pepper, salt, and sage, rub through a sieve, and then finish the chopping. But do not cut the meat too fine, as in that case the juice of the meat will be lost. Make the mixture up into patties and fry on a common pan, placed in the oven of the stove, taking care not to cook them hard. Veal is a good substitute for the lean pork in making these sausages, which are much better if made one day before cooking. Pot pie. The following I have found the best manner of making any kind of pot pie. White meat, such as chicken, quail, or nice veal, is decidedly the best for the purpose. Stew the meat until tender. In considerable liquid as when you put into the paste, much of that will be absorbed. In making the paste, take one quart of flour and two tablespoons of baking powder, rubbed well into the flour. 
one quarter pound butter or sweet lard, and a little salt. Mix with milk or water into a soft dough. Roll one half an inch thick, cut to size, and lay in a steamer for 15 minutes to make light. Then put in and around the stew, cooking slowly for 10 minutes. Curried Crab Put into a saucepan one quarter pound butter with a little flour. Cook together and stir till cool. Then add a gill of cream, a little cayenne pepper, salt, and a dessert spoonful of East India curry powder. Mix well together and add one pound boiled crab meat, chopped fine. Stir well together, make very hot, and serve. The addition of a glass of white wine adds to the flavor of this curry. To toast bread. Cut bread in slices one half an inch thick, first taking a thin crust from top, bottom, and sides, or shave the loaf before cutting. Otherwise, the crust will scorch before the soft part is sufficiently toasted. Cream toast. To make a delicious cream toast, mix well a teaspoonful of cornstarch with a little cold milk, and put in a stew pan with a piece of butter the size of an egg. Pour in hot milk and stir two minutes, adding a little salt. A little sugar is also an improvement, and pour over the toast while hot. Fritters. For eggs, well beaten. One quart of milk, one quart of flour, two teaspoonfuls baking powder, one tablespoonful sugar, and a little salt. Cook in best lard and serve with hard or liquid sauce highly flavored with California brandy or white wine. Hash. It is a mistaken idea, labored under by many, that hash can be made of waste material that would otherwise be thrown away. This is a most excellent and palatable dish if properly prepared. Take the shank or other parts of good beef you may have at hand and boil with as little water as possible until quite tender, and let stand until quite cold. Then take of potatoes that have been peeled before boiling, one-third the amount of the meat used, and chopped moderately fine, adding plenty of pepper and salt to taste. Next, chop two or three onions fine, and stew them in some of the liquid in which the meat was boiled, dredging in a little flour, and when thoroughly done, put in the hash and chop and mix thoroughly. If you think the mass requires moistening, add a little of the fat and juice. Put the whole in a pan, and bake in a quick oven until slightly browned at top and bottom. Should you have good corned beef, not too salt. It is very nice made in this manner. Use the marrow from the bones in making hash. Hashed Potatoes with Eggs Chop fine eight or ten cold boiled potatoes. Heat a pan. Cast iron is preferable. Quite hot. Put in butter the size of an egg. And as soon as melted, add the potatoes. Salt and pepper slightly stirring frequently. And when heated thoroughly, stir in four well-beaten eggs. Serve on a hot dish. Baked macaroni. Break the macaroni rather short. Wash and put in salted water. Boil about 20 minutes. Drain off the water. Replace it with a cup of good milk and one tablespoon of best butter. And as soon as boiling hot, put in a baking dish. If you like cheese, grate over it the best California article. Old cheese should never be used and bake to a light brown. The stewed macaroni, omit the baking and the cheese if you like. Drawn butter. To make drawn butter, take two tablespoons of flour, good butter, the size of an egg, a little milk, and make to a smooth paste. Then work in slowly one half pint of water until the flour is cooked. Season to taste. The foregoing will be found a good basis for nearly all hot sauces, for fish, beet, and other vegetables, as well as for puddings. Spiced currants. Two boxes of currants, washed and stemmed, three pounds sugar. 
one tablespoonful allspice, one tablespoonful of cloves, one tablespoonful cinnamon, boil half an hour. End of section 10. Section 11 of Clayton's Quaker Cookbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clayton's Quaker Cookbook by H.J. Clayton. Miscellaneous Part 3. The Best Method of Canning Fruits. There are various modes of canning fruits, almost every housekeeper having a method of her own. For the benefit of those who are at loss in this particular, we give the following mode, which we fully endorse as the best within our knowledge. Made use by Mrs. George W. Ladd of Bradford, Massachusetts, whose fruits, prepared in this way, have repeatedly taken the first premium at the agricultural fair, held in the old Bay State. This lady certainly deserves the thanks of all interested in this important matter, for her liberality in giving the public the benefit of her knowledge and experience in this line, as detailed in the following, published in the New York Graphic of August 15, 1883. As the season of ripe fruit advances, I prepare such quantities of syrup as I think I may need in this way. Three pounds of granulated sugar to one gallon of water and boil 20 minutes. This I put in glass jars when cool and set away for future use. Peaches, quinces, pears, apples, plums, pineapples, rhubarb, crab apples, and, in fact, all fruits of this kind. I peel, quarter, and place in a dish of cold water to prevent discoloration until I have prepared enough to fill a jar. I then pack them solid as possible in a jar and then fill the jar with the syrup previously prepared. I then place a wire stand in the bottom of my preserving kettle on which to place the jar, then fill the kettle with cold water until the jar is two-thirds covered. Leave the jar open, but cover the kettle and boil until the fruit is sufficiently soft. Have ready a little boiling syrup, if needed, to fill the jar full to overflowing. Then place the rubber band around the neck of the jar and screw the cover on as tightly as possible. Then, in from three to five minutes, give the cover another turn in order to be sure it is airtight and you will have no mortal trouble with it. I use mason's jars with metallic porcelain covers. Preparing quinces for canning or preserving. Quinces for canning or preserving should be kept in a dry place for 30 days after taking from the trees in order to give them richness and flavor. Peel and cut to the proper size, carefully saving skins and cores. Put the last named in a porcelain kettle and boil until quite tender. When, strain through a cotton bag. Afterwards, put the juice back in the kettle and add sugar as directed in the directions for canning fruit. Boil slowly for half an hour, taking off the scum as it rises. Then set aside to cool and can the fruit as directed in the receipt for canning. Clayton's Monmouth Sauce. In making this delightful ketchup, take 25 pounds of fresh or two 8-pound cans of tomatoes and slice, not too thin, adding five medium-sized onions cut fine. Put these with plenty of salt in a porcelain kettle, adding with a handful of hot green peppers or a less quantity, if dried, one ounce of white ginger, chopped fine one ounce of horseradish, and one half ounce each of ground cloves and allspice, and one lemon with seeds removed and cut small. After letting these boil for three hours, work through a sieve and return to the kettle, along with a pint of wine vinegar, two tablespoons sugar, two of good mustard, 
a teacup full of challenge or Worcestershire sauce and let boil for two or three minutes and set off. To prevent fermentation, stir in a teacup full of high-proof California brandy, if too thick, when cold, reduced with vinegar. To prepare mustard for the table, take one half pound best mustard and enough wine vinegar mixed with one third boiling water, one large teaspoonful of salt, one teaspoonful of sugar, juice of half a lemon, and mix to a thin batter, and put in a common glass jar and keep stopped tight. If pure mustard is used, treat it in this way, it will keep good for months. If you desire the best article of mustard, I think E.R. Durkee and Company's is the best I have ever used, although Coleman's ranks equally high. If you can get the genuine, unadulterated article, which can be had by procuring Cross and Blackwell's London brand, for which Messrs. Richards and Harrison are the San Francisco agents. Mint sauce. Into a teacupful of hot vinegar in which has been dissolved sufficient sugar to make slightly sweet, add a handful of mint chopped quite fine. Serve hot. Eggs ought never be poached. Poached eggs are always tasteless and also unhealthy, owing to the albumin going into the water into which they are dropped, giving it a white and milky appearance, taking away a portion of the richness which should remain in the egg rendering it indigestible and, of course, unwholesome. Sunnyside Roast. Select a good tender piece, either of beef or mutton. Veal and pork can also be nicely roasted in the same way. Place in your iron saucepan or pot one tablespoonful of good lard or half as much butter, and an onion, cut fine. Let your onion fry to a light brown and put in your meat, first having washed, dried, and salted it. Put the cover on and let stand until it is pretty well browned. Then add water, unless in danger of burning. Add only enough water from time to time to keep it from burning. Turn it frequently so that it may brown on all sides. When tender, it will come forth brown and juicy. Just before serving, See that there is enough water for gravy. If there is not, you can take out the meat and add enough, but not too much hot water, and then pour it over the meat. Clayton Spanish Omelet Chop into dice one quarter pound of breakfast bacon, a small tomato, four mushrooms, minced very fine, a small onion. Add pepper to taste. Put in a frying pan and cook slowly until the lean is done. Take off and put in a warm place to keep hot. This is sufficient for six eggs. Plain omelet. Beat the yolks and white of eight eggs separately until light. Then beat together. Add a little salt and one tablespoonful cream. Have in the pan a piece of butter. And when boiling hot, pour in the omelet and shake until it begins to stiffen. Then let it brown. Fold double and serve hot. Clam fritters. Sift into an earthen dish three spoonfuls flour and one half teaspoonful baking powder. Add to this a little of the clam juice, one half a cup of cream and two eggs, well beaten. Mince a pint of clams and mix with the batter. Put two or three spoonfuls of lard into a frying pan and when boiling, Drop in the batter by spoonfuls to fry. After frying a minute, take from the pan, drain, and serve. Fried tripe. If the tripe is boiled tender, cut in pieces two inches square. Season with salt and pepper and dip in a batter made of eggs, milk, and flour and fry in sweet lard or drippings from roast or corned beef. Ringed potatoes. Peel large potatoes. Cut them round and round as you would pear an apple. Fry in the best lard until a light brown. Sprinkle with salt and serve hot. New potatoes boiled. 
Wash and rub new potatoes with a coarse towel. Drop in boiling water and boil until done, taking care that they are not overboiled. Have ready in a saucepan some milk or cream with butter, a little chopped parsley, pepper, and salt. Drain the potatoes. Add them to the cream with a teaspoonful of cornstarch, soaked in a little milk. Let it come to a simmer and serve at once. Fried Tomatoes Take large, smooth tomatoes. Cut them in slices one half an inch thick. Dip in breadcrumbs or cracker dust and fry a light brown in half lard and half butter. Squash and Corn, Spanish Style Take three small summer squashes and three ears of corn. Chop the squashes and cut the corn from the cobs. Put into a saucepan a spoonful of lard or butter, and when very hot, an onion. Fry a little. Add the corn and squash, one tomato and one green pepper, cut small, and salt to taste. Cover closely and stir frequently to prevent scorching. Pickles. To make mixed pickles, cut small cucumbers crosswise in about four pieces. Onions, if not very small, in two. And peppers, if the ordinary size, in four pieces. Should you have green tomatoes, cut them small. Use a less amount of onions and peppers than cucumbers. Mix all together with a few bay leaves. Next, take a tub or keg, and having covered the bottom with fine salt, Put on a layer of pickles, adding alternate layers of each, leaving that of salt on top. Cover with a cotton cloth and lay on a stone or wooden weight. Let them remain three days. Then take out, rinse in cold water, but do not soak, and put them in a basket or sack to drain for 12 hours. Have ready plenty of California wine vinegar, made hot but not boiling, adding the following. Cloves, allspice, green ginger, and whole mustard seed, with one coffee cup sugar. When the vinegar is at scalding heat, pour over the pickles and cover. Nice Picolette Take four nice cabbages chopped fine, one quart onions chopped fine, two quarts, or sufficient to cover the mixture, best wine vinegar, Adding two tablespoonfuls each of ground mustard, black pepper, cinnamon, celery salt, one of mace, and one coffee cup sugar. Pack the cabbages and onions in alternate layers with a little fine salt between, and let stand until next day. Then scald the vinegar with the spices and sugar and pour over the cabbages and onions. Repeat this the next day, and on the third, Heat the whole scalding hot, let it cool, and put in jars, when it is fit for use at once. Pickled tripe. Pickled tripe is very nice, and that's sold by John Bale in the California market, which is cleaned by steam process and is quite tender and unsalted is a superior article. To prepare for pickling, cut in pieces about four inches square, say five or six pounds. Put into a kettle, cover with boiling water, adding a handful of salt. Let stand 15 minutes. Take out and drain, keeping warm. Mix one-fourth water with the best wine vinegar, to which add cloves, allspice, and mace, with one teacupful of sugar. Heat and pour over the tripe, and set away to cool. Tripe prepared in this way is the best for broiling or frying. To cook grouse or prairie chicken. The best way I have found for cooking this delicious game bird is, first, after cleaning, to cut off the wings and legs as, with the back, these parts are of little account. Next, split the birds in the center, taking out the breastbone, and you have two heavy pieces if the bird is large. Divide again. Do not wash, but wipe with a damp cloth. Season with pepper and salt, and broil with butter quite rare. Then lay in a porcelain-lined pan with butter and currant or grape jelly, adding a little cayenne pepper, 
and a small quantity of port or white wine. Venison steak may be cooked in the same manner. Brains and sweetbreads. When properly prepared, the brains of calves and sheep form a very inviting dish. Lay fresh brains in cold, salted water for 15 minutes, then put them in boiling water and parboil for 10 minutes. After cleaning off the outer membrane for frying, split them and season with salt and pepper and run them through egg beaten with a little milk. Roll them in cracker dust and fry to a light brown in equal parts of sweet lard and butter. The stewed brains, cut half the size for frying and put in a stew pan with a lump of butter, pepper and salt, a little water or soup stock, and one half an onion, chopped fine and stewed tender. Add this and cook slowly for a few minutes when put in two or three spoonfuls of milk or cream, add a little white wine or juice of lemon. Sweetbreads may be cooked in the same manner. Stewed spare ribs of pork. Cut the ribs in pieces of a finger's length and a width of two fingers. Put in the kettle with two onions, salt, and pepper, and cover with cold water. Let them stew slowly for two hours, and then put in three potatoes, two purple-topped turnips, which have been peeled and cut, and left in cold water at least two hours. Also add two tomatoes. This stew must have plenty of gravy, which can be made by working a little flour and butter with a few spoonfuls of rich milk, cooking five minutes. An Irish stew may be made in the foregoing manner by substituting ribs of mutton. Broiled Oysters In order to broil oysters properly, take those of the largest size, drain and dry in a cloth, and lay carefully on a nice wire gridiron that will hold them tight. Sprinkle slightly with salt and pepper and put them over a good clear fire for a short time and turn taking care not to broil too much. Serve with the best butter on a hot dish. End of section 11. Section 12 of Clayton's Quaker Cookbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clayton's Quaker Cookbook by H.J. Clayton Miscellaneous Part 4 Pumpkin or Squash Custard Take enough pumpkin or squash to make one quart when cooked, and after it is boiled or steamed, rub through a sieve and work in three eggs well beaten, with rich milk sufficient to make the proper consistence, adding sugar to taste. Season with ginger and allspice, and bake in cups or dishes to a nice brown. May be eaten hot, but is better cold. Fig pudding. Take one pint grated bread crumbs, one cup suet, one cup brown sugar, two eggs, and one half pound of fresh figs. Wash the figs in warm water and dry in a cloth. Chop the suet and figs together and add the other ingredients. Also one nutmeg, grated. Put in a mold or floured bag and boil three hours. Serve with hard sauce. Fried apples. Take six good cooking apples. Cut in slices one quarter of an inch thick. Have a pan of fresh hot lard ready. Drop the slices in and fry brown. Sprinkle a little sugar over them and serve hot. Clayton's Oyster Stew. In my long experience, I have found that the best way to stew oysters is, after having saved all the juice of the oysters, to put in a stew pan with a little boiling water and a good lump of butter, worked in a little flour, adding pepper and salt. Let these boil for two minutes, or long enough to cook the flour. Then put in the oysters, and the moment the stew boils up again, add a little sweet cream or country milk. And when it boils, the stew is cooked and should be set away from a hot fire. Cooked in this way, 
good oysters will never be tough and tasteless, as is too often the case. Boiled celery. Cut the white stalks of celery the length of asparagus. Boil in as little salted water as possible until quite tender. The root, cut in slices, is equally good. Dress with drawn butter made with the water in which the celery was boiled. This vegetable is said to be a sedative and antidote to nervous stability. Selecting meats. For a roast of beef, select from the ribs nearest the point of the shoulder blade, running backward. For steaks, choose that with the diamond bone on either side. For chops of mutton or lamb, select the rib. For roasting, choose the loin or saddle. And for boiling, the leg of mutton, but not of lamb, the latter being best roasted. For corned beef, select parts commonly known as the navel and plate pieces, and next best to these, the brisket and rounds. Rebecca Jackson's Rice Pudding Take one quart of rich milk, three quarters of a coffee cup of rice, well washed, and a lump of butter the size of an egg, and one nutmeg. This pudding must be made quite sweet, and without eggs. Bake three hours in a moderate oven, stirring occasionally the first hour. Bake until the top is a dark brown, to be eaten cold. This pudding which was a common dish in the last century, was generally baked on Saturday for Sunday's dessert. Bread and butter pudding. To one quart of milk add three or four eggs well beaten, with sugar enough to make rather sweet, and season with nutmeg or cinnamon. Put in a baking dish and cover with slices of nice bread, buttered on both sides. Bake until the bread is nicely browned, taking care, however, not to bake too much, which would make it watery, good either hot or cold. Codfish Cakes Pick boiled codfish in small bits, adding equal quantities of mashed potato and fish with two eggs well beaten, seasoning with black pepper and rolled in a little flour, the shape of a small cake. Fry in sweet lard or nice drippings to a nice brown but not hard. Pickled grapes. Remove from ripe grapes all imperfect and broken berries. Line an earthen jar with grape leaves and fill with grapes. To two quarts vinegar add one pint white sugar, one half ounce ground cinnamon, and one quarter ounce cloves. Let vinegar and spices boil five minutes. Then add the sugar and, when moderately cool, pour over the grapes. Force tomatoes. Peel and slice some large-sized tomatoes and put in a colander to drain. Cut in small pieces, one pint of mushrooms, adding some minced parsley, a slice of finely chopped ham, some summer savory, thyme, salt, and cayenne pepper. Put all these in a saucepan with some butter and one half cup of water. Boil together 10 or 15 minutes and set away to cool. Have ready some fine breadcrumbs, add to them seasoning and the yolks of two or three well-beaten eggs. Mix the mushrooms and tomatoes together, pour into a baking dish a portion of it, then sprinkle over it a layer of the breadcrumbs, and add the remainder of the tomatoes. Cover with breadcrumbs, and put some bits of butter on top. Bake half an hour in a well-heated oven. Broil flounders or smelts. Have medium-sized flounders or smelts cleaned with as little cutting as possible. Wash thoroughly in salted water and dry on a towel. Mix in a saucer three tablespoonfuls of olive oil and one of vinegar. With salt and pepper, score the sides of the fish at intervals of an inch with a sharp knife and rub all over with the mixture of oil, vinegar, and seasoning. Place them between the bars of a buttered gridiron and broil a light brown over a moderate fire. Onions. There is no more healthy vegetable or article of diet in general use than onions. Taken regularly, they greatly promote the health of the lungs and digestive organs. Used in a cooked, 
either fried, roasted, or boiled, or in a raw state. Their virtues are marked and beneficial. They are among the most popular of old-time remedies for colds, having the advantage of always being readily procured, and it is said that affections of the lungs and liver have been largely benefited and even cured by a free use of this palatable esculent. They are also resorted to as a sedative and remedy for sleeplessness. Singeing Fowls The best mode I have ever followed for singeing fowls is to put two or three tablespoonfuls of alcohol in a tin dish and light with a match, thus making a large flame without smoke. That is apt to injure the flavor of the bird. The Secret of Tests of Taste and Flavor The correct test of coffee or tea is to make use of a thin china or deltware cup by which the lips are brought close together, while a thicker cup would separate them widely apart. In testing the quality and flavor of wines, the thinnest quality of glass is for the same reason essentially requisite. Our grandmothers, who lived a hundred years ago, understood the philosophy of this when they expressed the opinion that it was only possible to get the true taste, fine flavor, and delicate aroma of tea by drinking it out of a china cup. How to choose where for ranges. In selecting where for a range, a special care should be taken to see that the bottoms of all the cooking utensils are perfectly level, for if convex, they will invariably burn in the center. An iron grating or gridiron, one quarter of an inch in depth, placed between the pan and the top of the range, will be found highly useful while cooking, as this increases the heat and lessens the liability of burning. Drying herbs for seasoning. All herbs should be gathered just before blossoming and dried in the shade, or in a dark, dry room, as exposure to the sun both takes away flavor and color. When perfectly dry, put in a clean sack and hang in a dry room or loft. When wanted for use, rub through a sieve. Herbs treated in this way, if left dry, will retain their strength and remain perfectly good for years, as long as the outer membrane of the leaves remains unbroken. The aroma cannot escape. To destroy roaches, flies, and ants. Take 15 cents worth of powdered borax in a small bottle of Persian insect powder and mix thoroughly together. In order to use successfully, take a feather from the wing of a turkey or goose by the quill and dipping the feather end in the powder, spring the feather as a bow. In this way, you can thoroughly rid the room of flies. Before using on roaches, set the doors wide open as they will start for the open air generally, however, dying on the way. To rid cupboards or closets of ants, sprinkle wherever these minute pests most do congregate. An easy and cheap remedy to rid pantries of cockroaches is said to be fresh cucumber parings laid in their haunts. We have never tested this remedy, but can vouch for the efficacy of the above-mentioned compound. To clean tinware. The best thing for cleaning tinware is common soda. Dampen a cloth, dip it in the soda, rub the ware briskly, after which wipe dry. Iron rust. Iron rust may be removed by a little salt mixed with lemon juice. Put in the sun, and if necessary, use two applications. Mildew. An old-time and effectual remedy for mildew is to dip the stained cloth in buttermilk and lay in the sun. Oysters roasted on chafing dish. Take largest oysters and put in the chafing dish in their own liquor. Season with red or black pepper, adding plenty of good butter with a little Worcestershire sauce or walnut catsup. After roasting, taking care not to roast too much, Serve on buttered toast. Codfish, family style. After the fish has been soaked 12 hours, boil slowly for 25 or 30 minutes or until it will break up nicely. Then pick all the bones out, but do not pick the fish too fine. Have ready three hard-boiled eggs. Rub the yolks in plenty of good butter. 
put into the kettle enough milk to heat the fish. When hot, stir in the butter with the fish. At the same time, have potatoes peeled and boiled. Cut, not too small, with the whites of the eggs cut small. Season with pepper. Serve hot with buttered toast at the bottom of the dish. Codfish in Philadelphia style. After soaking and boiling the fish, break up small. And picking out all the bones, have ready potatoes, peeled and boiled, equal to the amount of fish. Put them in a wooden bowl or tray. Pound or mash well with a potato masher. Work to soft dough with butter and well-beaten eggs and milk or cream. Season with pepper and salt if salt is required. Put in a dish suitable to set on the table and bake a few minutes or until light brown. End of section 12. Preface and Introduction of Clayton's Quaker Cookbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. Clayton's Quaker Cookbook by H. J. Clayton. Being a practical treatise on the culinary art adapted to the tastes and wants of all classes with plain and easily understood directions for the preparation of every variety of food in the most attractive forms, comprising the result of a lifelong experience in catering to a host of highly cultivated tastes. Preface One of the sacred writers of the olden times is reported to have said, Of the making of many books there is no end. This remark will, to a great extent, apply to the number of works published upon the all-important subject of cookery. The oft-repeated saying, attributed to old sailors, that the Lord sends victuals and the opposite party, the cooks, is familiar to all. Notwithstanding the greater number and variety of so-called cookbooks extant, the author of this treatise on the culinary art, thoroughly impressed with the belief that there is ample room for one more of a thoroughly practical and everyday life common-sense character in every way adapted to the wants of the community at large, and looking especially to the preparation of healthful, palatable, appetizing, and nourishing food, both plain and elaborately compounded, and in the preparation of which the very best and at the same time the most economical material is made use of, has ventured to present this new candidate for the public approval. The preparation of this work embodies the result of more than thirty years personal and practical experience the author taking nothing for granted has thoroughly tested the value and entire correctness of every direction he has given in these pages while carefully catering to the varied tastes of the mass everything of an unhealthful deleterious or even doubtful character has been carefully excluded and all directions are given in the plainest style so as to be readily understood and fully comprehended by all classes of citizens. The writer, having been born and brought up on a farm, and being in his younger days of a delicate constitution, instead of joining in the rugged work of the field, remained at home to aid and assist his mother in the culinary labors of the household. It was in this home school, in its way one of the best in the world, that he has acquired not only a practical knowledge of what he desires to fully impart to others, but a taste for the preparation in its most attractive forms of every variety of palatable and health-giving food. It was his early training in this homely school that induced him to make this highly important matter an all-absorbing theme and the subject of his entire life study. His governing rule in this department has ever been the injunction laid down by the chief of the apostles, try all things, prove all things, and hold fast that which is good. Introductory A Brief History of the Culinary Art and Its Principal Methods Cooking is defined to be the art of dressing, compounding, and preparing food by the aid of heat. Ancient writers upon the subject are of opinion that the practice of this art followed immediately after the discovery of fire, and that it was at first an imitation of the natural processes of mastication and digestion. In proof of the antiquity of this art, Mention is made of it in many places in sacred writ. Among these is notably the memoirs of the children of Israel, 
while journeying in the wilderness and their hankering after the flesh pots of egypt among the most enlightened people of ancient times cooking if not regarded as one of the fine arts certainly stood in the foremost rank among the useful it was a highly honored vocation and many of the most eminent and illustrious characters of greece and rome did not disdain to practice it among the distinguished amateurs of the art in these modern times may be mentioned alexander dumas who plumed himself more upon his ability to cook famous dishes than upon his world-wide celebrity as the author of the most popular novels of his day in the state in which man finds most of the substances used for food they are difficult of digestion by the application of heat some of these are rendered more palatable and more easily digested and consequently that assimilation so necessary to the sustenance of life and the repair of the constant waste attendant upon the economy of the human system the application of heat to animal and vegetable substances for the attainment of this end constitutes the basis of the science of cookery broiling which was most probably the mode first resorted to in the early practice of this art being one of the most common of its various operations is quite simple and efficacious it is especially adapted to the wants of invalids and persons of delicate appetites its effect is to coagulate in the quickest manner upon the surface of the albumen of the meat effectually sealing up its pores and thus retaining the rich juices and delicate flavor that would otherwise escape and be lost roasting comes next in order and for this two conditions are essentially requisite a good brisk fire and constant basting as in the case of broiling care should be taken at the commencement to coagulate the albumen on the surface as speedily as possible next to broiling and stewing this is the most economical mode of cooking meats of all kinds baking meat is in very many respects objectionable and should never be resorted to when other modes of cooking are available as it reverses the order of good wholesome cookery in the beginning with a slow and finishing with a high temperature meats cooked in this manner have never the delicate flavor of the roast nor are they so easily digested boiling is one of the easiest and simplest methods of cooking but in its practice certain conditions must be carefully observed the fire must be attended to so as to properly regulate the heat the utensils used for this purpose which should be large enough to contain sufficient water to completely cover the meat should be scrupulously clean and provided with a close fitting cover all scum should be removed as fast as it rises which will be facilitated by frequent additions of small quantities of cold water difference of opinion exists among cooks as to the propriety of putting meats in cold water and gradually raising to the boiling point or plunging into water already boiling my own experience unless in the preparation of soups is decidedly in favor of the latter Baron Leibig, the highest authority on such matters decidedly favors this process as in the case of roasting the application of boiling water coagulates the albumen thus retaining the juices of the meat that would be dissolved in the liquid stewing is generally resorted to in the preparation of made dishes and almost every variety of meats are adapted to this method the better the quality of the meats as a matter of course the better the dish prepared in this way but by careful stewing the coarser and rougher quality of meats can be rendered soft tender and digestible a desirable object not generally attained in other modes and pieces of meat trimmings scraps and bones the latter containing a large amount of palatable and nourishing gelatine may be thus utilized in the preparation of wholesome and appetizing dishes at a comparatively trifling cost an explanatory word in conclusion as a matter of strict justice to all parties concerned the author of this work deems it proper to explain his reason for mentioning in the body of some of the recipes given in this book the places at which the purest and best articles used are to be purchased this recommendation is in every instance based upon a thorough and complete personal test of every article commended in these degenerate days of wholesale adulteration of almost every article of food and drink it is eminently just and proper that the public should be advised where the genuine is to be procured without desiring to convert his book into a mere advertising medium the author deems it not out of place to give the names of those dealers in this city 
of whom such articles as are essential in the preparation of many of the recipes given in these pages may be procured, of the most reliable quality and at reasonable rates. End of Preface and Introduction